Oh, very good. Uh, we can hear everybody. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm so sorry for, for the hiccup. Um, good morning, Sir Jeffrey. Good morning, Mark. Thanks so much. Uh, and good afternoon here. I'm Cora Chan, Associate Professor of Law from the University of Hong Kong. On behalf of Hong Kong Youth Center for Comparative and Public Law, welcome to this conference. As we all know, the second reading of the Fugitive Offenders and Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters Legislation Amendment Bill will resume in LegCall tomorrow. This amendment bill is arguably one of the most controversial bills that the Hong Kong government has ever introduced uh, since the handover. This conference seeks to explore whether the bill provides sufficient human rights safeguards drawing upon comparative perspectives. We're pleased to have with us a panel of distinguished local and international experts. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. In the first panel session, we're pleased to have um, invited Mr. Philip Dykes, SC, uh, Chairman of the Hong Kong Bar Association, Professor Grenfell Cross, SBS SC, Honorary Professor of Law at the University of Hong Kong, and Honorary Visiting Professor of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, previously Director of Public Prosecutions of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. We are honored to have invited two distinguished speakers from the UK who are uh, joining us by Skype. Um, Sir Jeffrey Nice, QC, uh, one of the UK's most renowned human rights barristers, previously the chief prosecutor at the trial of Slobodan Milosevic at the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. Um, Sir Jeffrey, thank you very much for joining us again. And Mr. Mark Summers, QC, a member of the Bar Human Rights Committee of England and Wales, an expert in all areas of extradition, international law, and criminal EU law, previously chair of the Extradition Lawyers Association. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for um, lending us your expertise. In panel session two, uh, we are pleased to have Professor Albert Chen, Cheng Chen Lan Yu, Professor in Constitutional Law and member of the Committee for the Basic Law of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Dr. Asad Kiani, Assistant Professor from the University of Victoria, expert in domestic and international criminal law. Dr. Margaret Ng, Barrister, former member of the Hong Kong Legislative Council, and Professor Johannes Chan, Honorary SC, Professor at and former Dean of the Faculty of Law of HKU. Um, thank you very much to all of you for accepting our invitation to speak, uh, and thank you all of you uh, for coming to this conference. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's begin. Um, may we now invite Mr. Dykes to um, give his presentation. Mr. Dykes, please. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Am I being heard? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and my uh, colleagues who are distant in London. I assume that all of you will be familiar with the contours of the debate about this bill now. Uh, concern initially was with um, the protections that might be afforded by the judiciary in Hong Kong, uh, monitoring the um, uh, process through the courts. And you were told that the courts in Hong Kong uh, would do a first-class job. That's true. The Hong Kong bars would not dispute that. That's been one of its uh, main arguments. But that's not been enough. Uh, the government has recently had to say, well, there will also be assurances. We will extract assurances from other countries, including the mainland, that upon a person being surrendered or upon a piece of evidence being uh, uh, provided, that they will follow proper processes on the other side. So. My talk today will be on the issue of assurances and how do they figure in this um, context. Um, the conference title seems to assume that inadequacies in the bill might be addressed by reconfiguration to provide sufficient safeguards. But it's in the nature of legislation concerning extradition and providing mutual legal assistance that whatever protections are written into a piece of legislation, they can only go so far. They cannot recall a person surrendered or a piece of evidence provided to another jurisdiction by way of assistance once that person or thing is outside the jurisdiction. The ultimate issue of what happens to surrendered persons or evidence depends on the authorities in the other jurisdiction. They may honor 
to the letter the terms of an extradition or assistance agreement. They may, as sometimes happens, through a lack of resources or an incompetence or negligence, fail in some of those obligations. Or they may ignore the treaty altogether and treat the person surrendered or the piece of evidence provided in a way that makes a mockery of the terms of the agreement. Extradition and mutual assistance are founded on trust and because they are made between states on an equal footing under international law, there's a presumption that the other country will honour its obligations, so there is the principle of non-inquiry. The Hong Kong court will not inquire too much into what goes on in the other jurisdiction out of respect to that jurisdiction and because of this principle that we assume that we discharge our obligations in good faith. So the Hong Kong court has a limited jurisdiction to make sure that the relevant requirements in the agreement are met, so there be no extradition for political offence, there be no extradition for uh, extraneous reasons, so somebody is being prosecuted simply because they're a member of a religious group or a political organisation, or there's, a, no, there's no, to be no extradition for conduct, which would not be a crime in our jurisdiction. All those are set of formalities, and once those have been checked, the, um, uh, the court's job is finished. It's over to the chief executive to make a decision on whether or not to surrender that person where the requirements for extradition or surrender have been met. Now, if a country regularly disappoints when it's re received a person surrendered, then the simple solution for the other country is to end the agreement. And you'll find that all the extradition agreements we have under our future defenders orders all contain a clause about calling it off. The underlying concern with this bill, though, is of course safeguards in the process would allow Hong Kong residents and others to be surrendered to the mainland to face trial or serve a prison sentence there. The first and perhaps main point to consider is now is whether it's the right time to contemplate the surrender of fugitives or providing legal assistance to a jurisdiction which appears to subscribe to a notion of the rule of law which does not conform to our understanding. It's a jurisdiction that has a criminal justice system which is the object of suspicion, fear even, of many people in Hong Kong who have had first-hand experience of it or know somebody who has. I cannot say that because the mainland has its own understanding of what is meant by the rule of law, which appears to treat <clears throat> the words of and by interchangeable for reasons that are doubtless correct as a matter of constitutional law, uh, uh, Chinese constitutional law, it is only impossible for a person surrendered to that jurisdiction to get a fair trial, and if convicted, decent treatment when in jail custody. Individual cases with their own special characteristics may, perhaps with tailor-made assurances given by mainland authorities, uh, satisfy that. But I cannot say that they will get a fair trial. Which brings me to the case of the day, which was announced in New Zealand this morning. Kim, uh, this case uh, <coughs> has been going through the New Zealand courts for four or five years. It concerns a South Korean national living in New Zealand whose extradition was sought by the People's Republic of China to answer a murder charge in uh, uh, Shanghai. Uh, no extradition agreement uh, uh, existed with the PRC, so a one-off arrangement, rather like is contemplated here, was negotiated. Uh, Kim was uh, uh, committed to uh, go, the Minister of Justice who was responsible for extradition matters in New Zealand, uh, gave the go-ahead. There's a judicial review of that case. She was told to think again. She thought again, had another go at the uh, process. She decided that um, he could go. Uh, her decision was upheld at first instance, but the Court of Appeal this morning... Sorry? The Court of Appeal this morning in New Zealand have... Uh, overturn that decision. And it, the case is important because it's about assurances. 
And this is important. It's in the context of when assurances are given in a diplomatic context. Now, that's not going to occur in Hong Kong. The, that dimension is missing because of our own constitutional relationship with the mainland. But basically, I will tell you the, in essence, uh, from a 99 page judgment to a speed read this morning, um, the, the um, minister erred in four respects. Her assessment of assurances given in respect of Kim alone, let's just say just his case, should not have been isolated from the bigger question of whether, the, I quote, the human rights situation in the PRC more generally is such that assurances should not be sought or accepted. In other words, you don't look just at the particular assurance, you look at the bigger picture. So whether, in other words, whether objectively the human rights situation in a country is so dire that you shouldn't really accept uh, assurances and give it or give little weight to them. Secondly, her assessment that Kim was at risk of torture was flawed because there was evidence that torture was widespread in the PRC and that confessions of the torture were regularly used in the trial process. Her assessment of whether the, the, he would have a fair trial was also flawed as she used the standard of complete notification of the rights under Article 14 of the International Covenant of Civil Rights, which is in our Bill of Rights. The test should have been whether there's a real risk that there could be a departure from those principles. And she also heard specifically about the fair trial uh, in four respects that were not addressed in assurances, that there was undoubtedly political pressure in tr the trial process, and the judiciary was not independent. There was, um, the right to legal representation was compromised because of evidence that uh, defense counsel were harassed, harassed and bullied in the system. And the right to be compelled not to testify against yourself because of the concern that pre-trial detention could last for many, many months and there'd be regular interrogations at that time. So those were the main grounds for uh, uh, overturning the minister's decision. I've used my timer. That is the main point. But I would commend to you uh, one article that's been brought to my, well, I, I found it a couple of days ago, prepared by a counsel in the Attorney General's Chambers in Singapore who was responsible for extradition matters. Uh, this handout, if you've got it, uh, by Sabrina Chu, circumvented the China extradition conundrum relying on deportation to ch return Chinese fugitives. It's an excellent article because it's written from the viewpoint of trying to return people to China without uh, regular extradition treaties and resisting the temptation to use deportation procedures because they shouldn't be used to circumvent extradition. But this presents a, an up-to-date counter-assessment of this, the, the problems that there are with returning people to the mainland, or China to say. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dykes. Uh, may we now invite uh, Professor Cross? Just time. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I'm most grateful for the opportunity uh, to discuss the surrender of fugitives in the context of rights and responsibilities. Uh, as I'm limited in time, I'm going to speak very quickly because I want to cover as much ground as possible. Now, as you all know, the Security Bureau's amendments to the uh, Fugitive Offenders Ordinance are intended, so the government says, to promote effective criminal justice and to redress what they see as an intolerable situation. They will enable uh, Hong Kong to return fugitives on a case-by-case case basis to other parts of China, uh, as well as to over 170 countries, uh, with which it uh, currently has no extradition arrangements. Such uh, arrangements are used in uh, other jurisdictions. As Philip Dykes mentioned, one was used in, in uh, New Zealand, and they are, obvi are obvious utility uh, where long-term surrender arrangements are not yet in place. And given the existing vacuum which we have here, many fugitives from other places uh, have obtained sanctuary here in Hong Kong, 
uh, some from elsewhere in China, uh, others from around the globe. We know that over 300 fugitives from other parts of China are currently enjoying safe haven in Hong Kong, uh, including at least one alleged murderer, as well as businessmen already convicted of corruption and money laundering. But because of the weakness of our laws, they are able to avoid their just deserts uh, and cannot be returned to face justice. Apart from China, uh, no other country, not the United Kingdom, not the Russian Federation, and certainly not the United States, uh, would tolerate a situation uh, in which a suspect can simply evade justice by moving from one part of the country to another. Uh, and it is incumbent, surely, upon Hong Kong to try to break the impasse. Although we cannot know for sure how many fugitives from around the world are uh, evading justice by coming here, the Security Bureau's proposals will hopefully uh, have given them a rude awakening uh, and put them on notice that their time is up. Now, in the debate over the Security Bureau's proposals, the whole focus has been on the rights of suspects and what Hong Kong should do to protect their interests. Although their interests are obviously important, there is, I believe, another side to the equation which is often downplayed. No man is an island, said uh, John Donne, the poet, uh, and Hong Kong has wide respect, uh, responsibilities to other places, as well as to the victims of crime. Uh, and these cannot forever be shirked uh, on one pretext or another. Those who think that Hong Kong can simply evade its responsibilities to others by isolating itself and refusing to help other jurisdictions to pursue criminal suspects are doing it no favors at all, not least because it will result in a breakdown of trust. If Hong Kong falls down on its responsibilities to others, we cannot expect other jurisdictions to carry on assisting us. It has, for example, been estimated that since 2006, the mainland has transferred 248 suspects to Hong Kong to face justice, and this has helped us enormously to enforce the law, while Hong Kong has surrendered none, no one in return. Quite clearly, in the absence of reciprocity, assistance of this type could well dry up, uh, and we would have only ourselves to blame. Hong Kong has clear responsibilities to other jurisdictions, and if these are dis disregarded, there will inevitably be consequences. Those responsibilities are readily identifiable uh, and have repeatedly been emphasized. The UN Model Treaty on Extradition, for example, urges all states to, quote, strengthen further international cooperation in criminal justice. Since 2006, the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, which promotes efforts to combat global criminality, has applied to Hong Kong, and it requires states subject to domestic law to endeavor, quote, to expedite ex ex uh, extradition procedures and to simplify evidentiary requirements relating thereto in respect uh, of any offense to which this article applies. Again, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, which has also applied to Hong Kong since 2006, seeks to strengthen measures against corruption uh, and calls for effective uh, extradition mechanisms. Hong Kong, moreover, belongs to both the International Association of Prosecutors, the IAP, uh, and the International Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities, IACA. Whereas the IAP promotes international cooperation in the prosecution of fugitive offenders, the IACA encourages global anti-corruption efforts, uh, including the apprehension of suspects. However, the presence here uh, of large numbers of wanted fugitives and even convicted criminals makes a mockery of our international obligations. It sends out the message that although Hong Kong pays lip service uh, to fighting crime, it cannot in fact be trusted and is content to offer safe haven to fugitives no matter how grave their crime may be. Since 1960, moreover, the Hong Kong Police Force has belonged to the International uh, Criminal Police Organization, or Interpol, most recently as a sub-bureau of the National Central Bureau China. One of Interpol's most effective tools is the Red Notice, which is a request sent out to law enforcers everywhere to locate and provisionally arrest wanted fugitives, pending extradition or surrender. By netting fugitives, uh, it has helped to make the world less safe for uh, criminals everywhere. Last year, for example, uh, in the European Union, following an Interpol red notice intercept, uh, a man called uh, Yao Jin Shi from Xijiang province was apprehended uh, and uh, following, the internet, following the intercept, and he was sent back to China by Bulgaria to stand trial. However, in Hong Kong, the red notice system simply breaks down because many fugitives implicated here can be neither extradited nor surrendered, which undermines one of Interpol's key objectives, namely the return of fugitives as a deterrent to globalized crime. So Hong Kong is therefore not only letting itself down, but also its criminal justice partners around the world. Uh, and the time has come, in my, uh, I believe, for it to shed its image uh, as a criminal sanctuary. 
I firmly believe, ladies and gentlemen, that 22 years after reunification, the situation in which someone can, for example, rob a bank in Beijing, commit a rape in Shanghai, or traffic uh, drugs in Nanjing, and then claim safe haven in Hong Kong, cries out for redress. Although some people have described this state of affairs as a firewall, it is in reality a criminal's charter, which undermines effective law enforcement throughout the country and beyond. The Secretary for Security, John Lee Karchu, uh, obviously recognizes this, and his Bureau's uh, proposals offer a sensible means by which Hong Kong's responsibility to others can finally be honored. But there is, however, uh, a great difference between creating a mechanism which enables a person to be extradited and actually extraditing someone, uh, and hopefully people appreciate this. The United Kingdom, for example, has extradition agreements not only with democracies, but also with dictatorships, failed states, and states riven by civil war. But in reality, it would never extradite someone to one of those places. And I have no doubt that it would be the same here. Even with countries not in those categories, uh, extradition is by no means a given. Whereas, for example, the UK has an extradition treaty with the Russian Federation, it rejected 63 out of the 67 requests for extradition made by Russia uh, over the past 17 years. And likewise, the creation of a mechanism uh, for returning fugitives to other parts of China certainly does not mean that this will happen whenever a request is made, as there are numerous hurdles to be overcome. The Fugitive Offenders Ordinance, uh, uh, as you all know, uh, contains internationally recognized safeguards for suspects, uh, and these are replicated in Hong Kong's 20 existing fugitive surrender agreements. Because fears have been expressed that people might be at risk for political reasons, the proposals emphasize that there will be no surrender for offenses of a political character uh, and no surrender where the purpose of the request is to punish the wanted person on account of his political opinions or his race, religion, or nationality. Of course, there is no political dimension to most offenses, and other things being equal, there, there should be no particular difficulties uh, when cases of, say, burglary, uh, kidnap, or rape uh, are considered for surrender or when they are ultimately tried. No surrender, however, will be made uh, if the uh, suspect might be prejudiced at his trial or punished, detained, or restricted in his personal liberty uh, because of his, his political opinions, race, religion, or nationality. A fugitive will also not be returned if he might face the death penalty, if the crime is not an offence in both places, if extra charges might be brought, or if the double uh, jeopardy principle will be breached. So this is a formidable battery of protections, and the government, to allay concerns, has explained how these can be supplemented. On the fair trial issue, uh, it should, I believe, be remembered that different places obviously have different legal systems, some more advanced, others less so, and it is not always salutary for one jurisdiction to sit in judgment on another. Of course, different uh, systems develop at different paces and in different ways, but it certainly does not follow that other systems cannot be trusted or that they will not use their own judicial processes to establish guilt or innocence. Although some people are always eager to malign the mainland's legal system, its increasing alignment with our own in terms of better criminal procedures uh, and the quest for justice cannot forever be disregarded. Indeed, ever since the former paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, famously declared in the 1980s, we must build a modern legal system for China, progressive academics and jurists have taken him at his word uh, and worked tirelessly, often in the face of great resistance, to improve the criminal justice system. I have been privileged to meet many of these reformers and to discuss with them the improvements which have been made, uh, although they will readily admit that the legal system is still very much a work in progress. Most of the critics, unfortunately, uh, actually know very little uh, about uh, recent improvements to mainland criminal justice, and what is worse, many are simply not interested presumably because they interfere with their preconceived views of China's legal system. In March, however, when the Chief Justice of the Supreme People's Court, Zhao Jiang, delivered his work report for 2018, he said that the judiciary had sought last year to uphold two principles uh, in criminal cases, namely, no punishment where doubt exists and evidence obtained illegally cannot be allowed. This, of course, resonates with Western approaches to criminal justice, but it is certainly not coincidental because the mainland has sought to modernize its legal arrangements by studying other legal systems, including our own. There have been some significant reforms of late, uh, perhaps most notably in relation to involuntary uh, admissions. Whereas previously the courts were only concerned with whether an admission of guilt was true, without regard to the circumstances in which it was made, 
This has now changed at the urging of reformers. Uh, uh, and in uh, 2012, the National People's Congress overhauled the uh, criminal procedure law, as a result of which the courts must now exclude coerced confessions, even if, even if true. What is interesting, moreover, is that whereas in Hong Kong an accused person can be convicted solely on the basis of a confession, in the mainland the courts, uh, in addition to the confession, also look for corroborating evidence, which provides an additional safeguard. As regards the standard of proof, mainland judges, when you ask them, uh, say that they must be sure uh, of guilt before they can convict. It is not likely as away from our own standard of beyond reasonable doubt. Also, mainland law enforcers are now encouraged to video record the confession-taking process in the more serious cases so that the judges can see at trial how an admission came into existence. This, te <clears throat> excuse me, this technique, of course, was pioneered by Hong Kong's Independent Commission Against Corruption. It was then adopted by the Hong Kong Police Force, and it has now spread to the mainland and, indeed, to Macau. At trials, which are uh, generally held in public, Recent changes have seen witnesses appearing far more often than previously so that their evidence can actually be tested uh, and there is less reliance on uh, witness statements which are simply read into the record, which was the old way of doing things. And since the Regulation of Legal Aid Act took effect in 2003, the government, as in Hong Kong, uh, has been required to provide legal aid and it's available to accused who lack funds, as indeed it is also available for victims. Another fascinating development has been uh, in relation to people's assessors who are not dissimilar to Hong Kong's own jurors. Although they were originally introduced in the 1950s to give the public a voice in the judicial process, the People's Assessors Law, which was enacted last year, gives them equal rights with judges in trials unless the law specifically provides otherwise. The idea is to, quote, uh, achieve judicial uh, democracy. And although they normally sit on three-person uh, panel uh, collegiate benches, they are also el eligible in graver cases to participate in seven-person panels, uh, usually comprising three judges and four assessors. Although assessors cannot vote on legal matters, they can still discuss them, uh, but they vote jointly with the judges on factual issues, which are then decided, according to the legislation, by, quote, the principle uh, of majority rule. As an aside, when one asks critics of the Security Bureau's proposals if they are any way reassured by the increased role for people's assessors in tribal trials, their faces invariably glaze over. And it's a pity that ignorance of how the mainland's uh, criminal justice system is actually developing informs so much of the debate. And there has, moreover, been a significant improvement in judicial standards in recent times. Although until about 20 years ago, judges had little or no legal training, this has now changed. And anyone who aspires to be a judge or indeed a prosecutor or lawyer must pass the difficult national unified legal professional examination together with the separate judges test and this has raised uh, judicial standards considerably. And many of this new breed of judges, uh, prosecutors and lawyers have also studied law elsewhere, often in the United Kingdom, Germany uh, or the United States, but also in Hong Kong. And they are familiar with Western notions of criminal justice and this has undoubtedly impacted upon their work. However, having listened to the concerns, uh, the government has wisely agreed that in addition to the mandatory protections stipulated in the Fugitive Offenders Ordinance, additional safeguards can be acted, added given that the Amendment Bill allows the government to further limit the circumstances in which the uh, person may be surrendered. In consequence, the requesting party can be required to provide assurances that general human rights protections regarding surrender arrangements, including such matters as presumption of innocence, open trial, legal representation, right to cross-examination of witnesses, no reliance on co coerced testimony, and the right to appeal. Indeed, many of Hong Kong's existing surrender arrangements, uh, including those with Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines, already contain the safeguard that the requested party can refuse surrender if it may place it in breach of its obligations under international treaties. Uh, and the significance of this, of course, is that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights applies to Hong Kong, and this contains commitments to fair trial and, indeed, uh, to the rights of appeal. Now, as regards the role of the Chief Executive, there are established mechanisms in place which mirror those uh, in other common law jurisdictions. Once the request is received, the Chief Executive will decide if the circumstances of the case require the questing, requesting party to provide extra guarantees, if these are refused, the case ends there. If they are given, an authority to proceed uh, will be issued, unless, of course, it appears that an order for surrender could not lawfully be made 
or would not in fact be made. The CE is not required to decide if the evidence in support of the request is sufficient, but simply whether there is enough evidence to justify a magistrate deciding if there is a prima facie case. If the CE issues an authority proceed, this may be challenged by way of judicial review, which is an additional safeguard. The decision taken by the magistrate, of course, can be subject to a review and indeed uh, to habeas corpus. And when the, when the case gets back to the chief executive, if it does, then the, uh, then the chief executive's decision can also be judicially reviewed. Although some people have expressed concerns that the chief executive might be directed to surrender a suspect by the central government, I believe this is fanciful, not least because established legal procedures cannot be, be bypassed in that way. It is the courts, not the CE, that decide if an order of committal should be made, and if a suspect is discharged, there is no way the CE could then order his surrender. In any event, I do not believe that the central government would give illegal instructions to the CE, quite the contrary. Because of the sensitivity of the case, I would expect it to lean over backwards to ensure that proper procedures are followed, uh, and that it would avoid doing anything that might place the uh, chief executive in an invidious position. Some people have suggested that uh, once a fugitive is returned to the mainland, any guarantees given may be disregarded. I take the view, however, that the mainland courts, aware of the interest of the case, will actually go the extra mile uh, and do all they can to ensure that the fugitive is appropriately treated on return. And the precedents support this view. After all, the mainland, like other jurisdictions, understands full well that if fugitives do not receive justice, as promised, uh, it will forfeit the trust of others, and its future requests will be imperiled. Now, my time is up, and I'm just going to do, finish with my final paragraph. Moreover, 55 places have now signed extradition agreements with China, of which about 40 are now in force. They include nine European uh, Union member states, uh, amongst whom Bulgaria, in the case of uh, Yao Jinqi, wanted for corruption, France, in the case of Chen Wenhua, wanted for embezzlement, Italy, in the case of the fugitive uh, named Zhang, wanted for theft, and Spain, in the case of the 218 Taiwanese telecom fraud suspects, 94 of whom were retain, returned to Beijing just last week, following two years of judicial proceedings, have recently returned fugitives to China without problem, which makes the EU's professed concerns over the Security Bureau's proposals uh, all the more extraordinary. Even in the absence of such agreements, the United States, in the case of Yu Zhendong, wanted for fraud, and Yan Yin Zhan, wanted for bribery, and the fugitive named Zhu, intercepted on Interpol uh, red notice alert for violation of personal rights, and Canada, in the case of Lai Chan Xing, wanted for smuggling, have also returned fugitives subject to assurances uh, as to future treatment. In all these uh, instances, ladies and gentlemen, China has honored the guarantees requested of it, uh, and, and uh, fair-minded observers would be entitled to conclude they will also do likewise uh, in respect of any fugitives returned from Hong Kong. Now, in conclusion, the basic law's 50 years unchanged provision for Hong Kong's system uh, reaches its conclusion in 2047, and nobody knows for sure what will happen after that. There will undoubtedly be some people in Beijing who will take the view that one country, two systems has run its course, outlived its purpose, and should, no, should not be continued. I imagine, there, however, that everyone here hopes that our current arrangements will survive beyond 2047, but the chances of this happening will be far greater, I suggest, if Hong Kong shows itself to be a responsible part of the nation, willing to shoulder its responsibilities uh, in the combat of crime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Cross. Uh, I'll now hand over to our panelists. Oh, I'll now hand over uh, to our panelists from the UK, but before I do that, um, I would like to thank uh, Baroness Helena Kennedy, QC, Director of Human Rights Institute of the International Bar Association, and Shona Jolie, QC, Chair of the Bar Human Rights Committee of England and Wales, who have been very supportive of our conference. They can't be with us um, today, but they've sent their good wishes for this conference, which we're very grateful for. They've also shared, um, they would also like to share um, uh, the positions of their organizations um, on the amendment bill. Um, and these positions are set out in a joint statement, uh, which I will now relay. Um, and I read um, from the statement. The Bar Human Rights Committee of England and Wales and the Human Rights Institute of the International Bar Association are deeply concerned about the Hong Kong government's proposed amendments. Um, extradition law must ensure and contain safeguard for the protection of human rights. Surrender of any individual person to an extradition request must not result in a breach of the individual's human rights 
Both, organization, both of our organizations consider that the proposed changes to Hong Kong's extradition law, which will broaden the current extradition arrangements to mainland China and introduce potentially arbitrary assessments, is likely to have the effect that individuals surrendered are at real and serious risk of their human rights being violated. This includes exposure to grave violations, including torture and other ill treatment. China's human rights record remains a matter of grave concern. Moreover, serious concerns about China's justice system, including its lack of independence, mean that fair trial rights are severely jeopardized for those surrendered, potentially on a political case-by-case -case basis, bringing the risk of real crisis to the rule of law in Hong Kong. We appreciate that Hong Kong is an international hub and its extradition laws are of importance not just for the people and residents of Hong Kong, but more widely, including those traveling or working or passing through Hong Kong. The wide range of people potentially likely to be affected by the proposed changes place these proposals squarely into an international context as well as a matter of fundamental domestic concern. It is imperative that the rule of law coupled with the protection of human rights in Hong Kong requires jealous guarding and careful consideration. It is a complex issue which cannot afford the luxury of complacency or error. Both of our organizations call upon the government of Hong Kong to place the human rights concerns protected through Hong Kong's international legal obligations squarely at the forefront of its extradition laws. This requires the immediate suspension of the proposals to ensure careful analysis of the context and consequences for Hong Kong and the wider international community. We regret we could not be with you today at this important conference, but we are delighted that Mark Summers QC of Matrix Chambers and the BHRC was able to share with you his expertise of the interaction between extradition and human rights law in the UK, and we're keen to be updated on the outcomes of today's conference. Um, Helena and Shona, if, if you're watching the live streaming from the UK, thank you very much for sharing with us your views. Although you can't be with us today, um, the spirit of careful and rational analysis that you call for is very much with us today and will guide our discussions. Um, Sir Jeffrey Nice QC, uh, Sir Jeffrey, uh, um, I'll now, uh, well, the stage is now yours, I'll now hand over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for inviting me to take part. I explained when you invited me, and I'm happy to explain again. I can be brief because I'm not an extradition lawyer, and therefore only have a limited amount that I can contribute to your important conference. And what's more, I'm going to be followed by somebody who is an expert extradition lawyer and tells me all matters of detail to him. My contribution really is limited and general, but I make the first observation unaware of the extent, or I turn to my lack of awareness of the extent to which Professor Ross's account of the legal system in mainland China, the Republic of China, will be accepted by those in uh, It is at variance, I think, substantially at variance with the view of the uh, legal system in the People's Republic of China held by many other people, and to some extent it's going to be impossible to reach any kind of consensus today, I think, if the great divergence of views of China's performance as a legal system exists. Just to explain a couple of points, and, and then not having much more to say, I'll say this. I first, I'm no expert in Hong Kong either, uh, and I've never been to Hong Kong. I first became involved when I was asked to talk to one of the democracy movement people a few years ago. And I and others sought to do what we could to help if help was needed. The immediate impression I got was two things, really, which may or may not be of value to you. First, the impression given to a faraway country, to those who have only the knowledge and interest of newspapers and television reports and talking to people from Hong Kong is that the impression is that the establishment of Hong Kong may not have been that vigorous or that determined to retain the rule of law in the face of uh, the pressures from Hong Kong. That it may have been yielding after the events of 2014, perhaps it got Tired, it may have been yielding too much to pressure from Hong Kong. Now, events of the last couple of days would 
tend to show that that impression of mine was completely false. And may I hope be pleased to know that the demonstrations that happened in the last few days have been given an enormous amount of coverage, both in English newspapers and indeed on television and on the radio. The second impression I got, and this may or may not be important for you, but is that it was going to be very difficult to generate enthusiasm amongst, say, English lawyers if help was needed in Hong Kong with their rule of law um, uh, problems, the kind that it seemed to be emerging from my conversations with people, the democracy movement, and also from this particular piece of legislation, despite Professor Croppy's defense. Of, now, if my first impression was wrong, as the recent demonstrations show, the question is, for me at any event, whether help is needed or assistance is needed in, from other countries in assisting Hong Kong with what it may need to do to resist China's pressures coming as they do either directly from China or from parts of the uh, legislature in Hong Kong itself. And I have to say that Hong Kong's problems are not regarded nationally as high on the agenda of people to look around the world and seek to do good. Why that is, I'm not sure. Maybe Hong Kong seen as a small but very successful and perhaps wealthy place. Uh, there may be other reasons. The recent events that have taken place may have made it possible for assistance to be given. And as a, a representative, not of the specialist part of the bar that your next speaker comes from, is the bar of England and Wales generally. If help is needed, uh, then it will be forthcoming. And from a great distance, you know, the, the view of Hong Kong, at least my view of Hong Kong and the problems it faces, are some, somehow reflections of what Pastor Niemöller said in his very famous poem when he was talking about Nazi Germany, and talking about how first they came to the communists, and I wasn't a communist, so I didn't speak up for them, and then they came for the socialists, and then the Jews, and then finally they came for me, he said, and uh, there was nobody left to speak up for me. And that sentiment uh, occurs in thinking often at the moment as the world moves to a different place from what it was with Trump encouraging uh, narrow nationalism or nation state uh, nationalism, as right wing governments being formed where intervention in the affairs of others is going to be regarded as less and less appropriate. And so, uh, we, at least some of us from afar, view the problems of Hong Kong in this way. If this problem, this particular problem, which requires expertise and which I don't have any to contribute, if this problem is a serious rule of law problem, and if it is resolved in the wrong way, then this will be one step down in the international value, respect, and operation of the rule of law. It will be one of those people for whom others did not speak up. It will be the first in a series of dominoes that if China, the People's Republic of China, has the intentions that many think it does to become such a dominant force and to impose its standards on the standards of others, it will be a step will it be very difficult, if not impossible, to reverse. Therefore, uh, uh, I ask, at least I'm going to learn a lot. This is a conference where I can learn rather than really contribute. And if at the end of it, it remains the position that it looks as though help may be valuable if it comes from abroad in your general rule of law problems, in your democracy problems, you have to find a way of stimulating the interests of able to seize lawyers so they will engage in uh, affairs that concern you and for your general assistance and benefit. The two particular problems, I think, or three particular problems that I would ask fellow panelists to deal with, in light particularly of Professor Cross's protestations that the China, the, the, the uh, legal system in the People's Republic of China will not be abusive of those who may be returned there. What is likely to be the position under this new piece of legislation for democracy proponents, human rights advocates, um, who may now be either in custody in, in Hong Kong or 
of those opinions and living in Hong Kong. I look forward to answers on those questions. They seem to be particularly vulnerable groups. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Jeffrey. Um, we'll now pass over to uh, Mark, uh, uh, Mr. Mark Summers, you see. Um, I think Mark has prepared some very helpful slides for us, uh, which we are going to show right now. Um, you should have a hard copy of your slides with you as well. If you don't have a copy, raise your hand. Our helpers will, will give you a copy. Um, and speakers, you sh uh, we, we should all have a hard copy of those slides as well. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Very clearly. Wonderful. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak today on behalf of the Bar Human Rights Committee. Um, from what we've just heard, it's clear that there's a, a great deal to be said about the rule of law implications of this bill. Um, uh, but I want today to examine with you, if I may, one of the key propositions that appears to underpin this bill, and that's this, that there are similar ad hoc or case-based surrender arrangements practiced in the UK and Canada, and to that list you could add Spain or France or Italy or any of the other countries who are prepared to extradite to uh, the mainland China. And I want to explain why the Bar Human Rights Committee disputes, fundamentally disputes that opposition. Uh, yes, it is true that there are ad hoc extradition arrangements in existence in the UK, as we will shortly see. Uh, but no, it's not true that the situation in the UK is remotely comparable uh, with the, the, the system that these pro proposals seek to put in place. Let me explain uh, why. Um, I, I'm pleased to hear that you have uh, the slides in front of you. Um, I'm going to have to, like other speakers, um, take them very quickly indeed. Um, ad hoc or special extradition arrangements. Um, they're not the same as bilateral or multilateral treaty arrangements. Uh, those signal uh, established trust and confidence in another country's judicial and human rights uh, systems. Uh, these serve a completely different purpose. They are an emergency measure. Uh, they are, it is fair to say, and you have section 194 um, replicated for you, triggered by ministerial certification, and they do rest on uh, a memorandum of understanding. But they are, and have always been regarded, certainly in the UK, as an emergency measure for use in exceptional circumstances. In fact, they've only ever been used twice in this country. Firstly, in respect of a Rwandan genocide request, uh, that's to say uh, crimes affecting the international legal order, and most recently in respect of uh, a cooperation with the uh, Republic of China, the Taiwanese uh, government, a country with whom the UK is able to repose trust and confidence in its judicial and human rights system, but where treaty relations are impossible for other and obvious reasons. But shortly, it's never been recognized as a substitute for ongoing or failed treaty negotiations. Uh, so what then of these proposals uh, in Hong Kong that seem to believe uh, that the Hong Kong extradition legal order is in line with common international practice, and therefore uh, that Hong Kong is doing nothing other than replicating the section 194 system. Let's examine that and let, let, let's do so um, in two ways. First, let's look at the UK system that's in place and then compare it to the system that currently exists in Hong Kong. So st step back, please, and uh, let's look at the UK extradition uh, system. And let's take uh, mainline China out of the equation for these purposes completely and, and use another example, some other state with dire judicial and human rights records, North Korea, Chad, uh, countries such as that, with whom uh, the UK's only basis of uh, extraditing or, or, or undertaking legal relations for the purposes of extradition is ad hoc arrangements under section 194. Why is it acceptable for extradition arrangements uh, with states such as those uh, 
uh, which manifestly don't respect human rights and don't possess independent, robust judiciaries to exist at all. Uh, and why is that? Uh, so, especially where uh, extradition arrangements such as this have retroactive application. They apply to offences committed whenever uh, committed. Um, and where the very act of establishing extradition relations, including ad hoc ones, establish assumptions uh, that human rights compliance exists. Well, the answer to that uh, is, uh, is itself uh, human rights. Uh, everyone understands that there is a fundamental public interest in not creating safe havens for criminals. Uh, but all states also recognize that that issue is not binary, uh, that it's only one side of the equation, uh, and that extradition relations must operate compatibly with human rights. And most countries, the UK included, uh, and to my knowledge, all of those that have been mentioned so far today uh, who have signed treaties with China, France, Spain, Italy, to name uh, some European ones, operate modern extradition schemes, schemes which are focused on human rights and contain robust judicial protections against exposure to human rights violations. Uh, now, if uh, somebody could be kind enough to turn, flip through the uh, slides to slide eight, um, we will, <laughs> perhaps. Anyway, um, in your slides, uh, you have, for example, section 82 of the UK's Extradition Act, it's passage of time protection. Uh, protection against extradition in ancient cases where a fair trial is obviously no longer possible or is otherwise oppressive. Uh, you have Section 83A, the forum protection uh, for concurrent jurisdiction uh, cases, a mature and detailed provision which enables the UK courts to determine whether the UK is the more appropriate forum uh, for trial. Even when uh, the UK has thus far ceded jurisdiction to the requesting state. Section 85, trials in absence, a substantially and noticeably more robust provision than that which appears under the Fugitive Offenders Act. Note in particular subsection 8 of section 85 and the kind of guarantees that the UK legislature expects uh, for any uh, retrial following conviction in absence. Section 91, uh, a power in the UK courts uh, to uh, refuse extradition in cases of uh, physical or mental ill health. Abuse of process, a judge made implied jurisdiction to protect people against bad faith. Uh, uh, but most importantly of all, Section 87, a uh, straightforward human rights prohibition on extradition where extradition is not compatible with convention rights and the convention there being spoken about of course is the European Convention on Human Rights uh, in Hong Kong uh, of course uh, you would have the Bill of Rights or the International Covenant uh, and under section 87 uh, lies real judicial protection against exposure to human rights violations. So Article 3 of the European Convention, inhuman degrading treatment, enables the UK courts to protect against exposure to uh, awful prison detention conditions um, or disproportionate sentences uh, and, and a whole host of other issues. There can't be and isn't in the UK any rule of non-inquiry. Uh, the European Court itself uh, has ruled that the act of surrender exposes a, to a violation uh, uh, itself involves a violation of those human rights. And that's the case even within the restrictive EU federal system of extradition. And for example, the case of Mohammed, uh, where extradition has been outright refused to Portugal uh, for its prison conditions. Taiwan, uh, on, an, on an ad hoc basis, survived that intense judicial uh, scrutiny. Uh, this kind of examination includes, on occasion, uh, inspections, physical inspections of foreign prisons, uh, and a real relaxation of the rules of evidence 
to enable parties to bring to the attention of the court publicly available materials uh, such as amnesty reports, human rights watch reports, State Department reports, uh, Article 6, fair trial guarantees. Uh, there doesn't have to be complete correlation uh, between the judicial systems of one state and another, but exposure to a flagrantly unfair uh, judicial system is unacceptable. Uh, extraditions to Russia, to Turkey, are habitually refused by the UK for this reason. The ad hoc extradition arrangement made with Rwanda failed and failed twice for this very reason. The Rwandan judiciary not sufficiently impartial and independent. The arrangements for uh, robust defense uh, procedures simply not in place and not adequate. And today's New Zealand judgment uh, tells us, uh, if, if we needed telling, that a rosy view of contemporary criminal justice in the mainland China is uh, premature at the best. In short, uh, the UK courts possess a robust human rights oriented extradition scheme capable of preventing and stopping extradition in appropriate cases under the right to liberty, exposure to civil detention in the USA. Uh, under Article 8, the right to family life or proportionality, uh, respecting the rights of dependent children, uh, protecting against trivial offences, and all bolstered by a mature and developed system for taking and assessing assurances of human rights compliance. In the first instance, there must be some kind of assessment as to whether this state is one uh, where uh, any weight at all can be given to assurances. Uh, the European Court has said that Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan simply aren't up to it so far as their human rights system is concerned. So, and the New Zealand judgment tells us that the jury is still out on the mainland, even on that front. But even if the state is someone from whom uh, assurances can be taken, uh, then they are assessed rigorously. Um, uh, and often, it, Paragraph 189 contains a long list of the type of things that the UK court will take into account to assess uh, assurances of human rights compliance. Subsequent monitoring, for example, is uh, absolutely essential. Uh, of course, uh, countries with whom ad hoc arrangements are made can survive uh, a, a robust human rights analysis. Taiwan did, uh, but uh, that robust human rights analysis to result in a different outcome for mainland China. So then what of the Hong Kong position? The Fugitive Offenders Act, as it currently stands, enables the Hong Kong courts to monitor dual criminality, prima facie evidence, convictions in absence, political motivation, double jeopardy, and speciality. Uh, that uh, system uh, is certainly in our view, the, the product of a previous age. Uh, the political offence exception is hollow, it's redundant, it's no longer uh, contained in most modern extradition treaties. No persecuting state uh, really nowadays requests extradition for any political offences. Improving political motivation is almost impossible in practice. What is required in the modern extradition context is a system that possesses fundamental human rights protections such as those that are vested in the UK Extradition Court and the courts of France, Italy, Spain, and the like. Uh, the Hong Kong's current system contains, with respect, none of them, not even any basic requirement uh, that the court be satisfied that exposure uh, to uh, the system or the act of extradition doesn't involve any violation of Hong Kong Bill of Rights or the International uh, Covenant. Uh, the uh, protections, so far as they are found in Hong Kong law, uh, seem to us, uh, when they do exist, to be happenstance. Uh, the uh, provisions of Section 3, Subsection 1 of the Ordinance uh, enable the additional protections that are often read into treaties uh, to uh, form part of the court's jurisdiction, uh, 
uh, we note with interest, for example, the Netherlands order uh, adds to the list of protections that are, are noticeably absent from the ordinance itself, uh, triviality, delay, uh, humanitarian considerations, or breaching obligations under international treaties, uh, such as, for example, the international government. Um, but of course, that's all happened starts. Uh, Hong Kong law doesn't require those uh, protections to be in place, and neither, as it seems to us, uh, does uh, the new clause 3A or any of the uh, 31st of May uh, proposals. Unless the context or content of, of Annex 2 is written into Hong Kong law, uh, in addition to there being no political incentive to agree any of those things, there's no power to compel the chief executive to agree, agree them, or any power to review failure to agree any of those aspirational proposals, uh, which, uh, it also has to be said, uh, don't include any protection against Article 3 violations, uh, in human degrading treatment, uh, the right to liberty, uh, coerced evidence, triviality, delay, forum, and, and even if all of those things were to appear in an ad hoc arrangement with mainland China, uh, compliance with those things, as we see it, will be determined and assessed by the chief executive, not the judiciary. Uh, section 3A, subsection 2, still talks about conclusive uh, certification of those uh, issues. What power does a Hong Kong court have, or will it have, to say that a fair trial in any other state, such as and including mainland China, is not guaranteed in practice? And what power does a Hong Kong court have, or will it have, uh, to rule that torture is practiced in practice, uh, and notwithstanding uh, the uh, certification of the chief executive? Uh, and the Human Rights Committee also has obvious concerns about these things being decided and assessed by a chief executive uh, whose appointment depends, uh, in some measure at least, on uh, the state uh, whose assurances uh, she is assessing. It, it is certainly a fundamental principle of English extradition law that these issues uh, be judicially supervised, uh, not uh, supervised by the executive. So in conclusion, even leaving aside the broad, important, and disturbing rule of law implications of these proposals, uh, the Bar Human Rights Committee believes that the Hong Kong's current extradition system isn't nearly robust enough to carry the burden of the ad hoc extradition scheme it is proposing, and the Bar Human Rights Committee stands alongside all those others who have called for its immediate suspension, pending at minimum radical overhaul of the Hong Kong's extradition laws. Uh, thank you very much for asking uh, me to speak. And, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was a, an extremely in, informative and insightful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, we will now have some time for discussion amongst panelists. Before we start that session, um, I'd first like to check with Mark and um, Sir Jeffrey, uh, because we started a bit late, would it be okay if we overrun by about 15 minutes? I know that, um, that this session is due to end at 5.30. Would it be okay if we end at about 5.45? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll now have 15 minutes uh, reserved for discussion amongst uh, panelists uh, before opening it up to the floor. Um, and uh, I'd like to invite speakers to direct questions to or respond to uh, other panelists or, or raise issues to be discussed. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, if, I, if I may start uh, first, uh, the, I think in assessing the, the sufficiency of the court's uh, powers and, and safeguarding human rights, uh, we need to look at first the sufficiency of their legal powers. Um, and we've, we've focused uh, quite a bit on that. Uh, but second, uh, in addition to looking at the sufficiency of legal powers, we've also got to look at the sufficiency of their political powers. Um, to, to what extent can we realistically expect courts to make full use of the legal powers that they've got? Um, and I think this, well, this is a very important issue because it affects, um, well, number one, it affects whether 
the, 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 the powers and safeguards that we've seen in other jurisdictions uh, will in fact work in Hong Kong. For example, uh, the, the Kim case uh, that was handed down earlier today uh, in which the courts uh, robustly exercised powers of judicial review um, um, to return a decision to, to, to surrender a fugitive to China. Do we realistically expect that a Hong Kong court will be able to do the same in relation to uh, a, 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 a decision to surrender a fugitive to, to China, for example. Um, the, the second implication uh, of, what, of the point that I've made is that the sufficiency of the level of safeguards um, might differ depending on what jurisdiction we are talking about, uh, what jurisdiction Hong Kong has surrendered fugitives to. Um, if we are talking about a foreign jurisdiction uh, which has no special ties with China, which China has absolutely no interest in, in interfering with, interfering in the matter with, then uh, we, we can envisage Hong Kong courts uh, uh, being rigorous and doing something like what the New Zealand Court of Appeal has done, robustly exercising powers of judicial review to uh, to strike down decisions for surrendering a fugitive to that particular jurisdiction. But uh, so the, the level of safeguards might be sufficient uh, insofar as these jurisdictions are, are concerned, but whether they are sufficient in relation to surrender decisions to uh, mainland China, uh, the, the answer might differ. So the same set of safeguards might be sufficient um, for guaranteeing rights uh, in, in relation to some jurisdictions but not in relation to others. And, and we, what we're concerned with here is not just potentially not just mainland China, because uh, given that, uh, uh, that uh, China has powers over foreign affairs and defense, uh, might it be possible that um, if Hong Kong courts were to pass a judgment on the credibility of assurances in an ally of China, say um, Kazakhstan, for example, uh, then um, China might ha have a stance on this and wouldn't want Hong Kong courts to say something that might jeopardize foreign relations between China and that foreign state. So uh, I think the, the, the first point that I, the first observation that I have is that apart from discussing political, sorry, apart from discussing what legal powers Hong Kong courts have, uh, we also need to look at the political realities. And this is not to say that courts are not independent in Hong Kong. Uh, we're not saying that they, they we, we all recognize that they could be very robust, uh, rather, it's to recognize the political constraints within which our courts operate. Courts are rational actors. We cannot realistically expect courts to do something that is suicidal. And, and ultimately, it's the NPCSC that has final powers of interpreting the basic law, including the scope of powers of the courts in the basic law. Uh, and also, ultimately, uh, it's, it's, it's China that has powers of determining whether to grant Hong Kong a separate common law legal system. So it is, it is one might even argue that um, in pragmatic institutional concerns of survival are legitimate judicial concerns. So, so it's not questioning the court's integrity or professionalism, rather it's, it's putting the court's, um, it, it's, it's about understanding properly the political context in which the courts operate. Um, so uh, with, with that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the others have um, lots of questions and comments, so maybe I'll, I'll open, open it up to, to speakers. Uh, yes, Albert. And then Johannes. Uh, uh, yes, I, I have a question for um, Mr. Summers. Uh, actually, it's a legal question, uh, which probably uh, does not uh, does not fit very well into the political question which Cora has just raised. Uh, the legal question is: um, What do you think uh, is the um, power or the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong courts to do something? similar to what the UK courts uh, have been doing uh, to ensure that uh, extradition would be compatible with convention rights uh, under sections 84 to 86 of the UK Act. Um, as you know, Hong Kong uh, uh, has got uh, the, uh, the constitutional protection of the um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, which uh, has been codified into Hong Kong's Bill of Rights Ordinance. And, and the courts have, from time to time, um, 
enforce these rights, um, even though they are not expressly provided for in a particular ordinance. For example, in one case, the court uh, held that uh, removal or deportation of a person to to a country where he he uh, is at risk of facing torture or, or cruel, unusual, and in, uh, inhuman uh, punishment or treatment w would be a violation of uh, the, the the constitutional protection of of rights in Hong Kong. So, if the court is going to pursue this line of jurisprudence. Will it um, assert some kind of power similar to what the UK courts uh, have uh, have? I mean, a power which UK courts have uh, expressly under Section 87 of the uh, UK Act. Uh, yes, maybe um, I'll allow Mark to uh, uh, briefly address this first before passing the mic to Johannes. Uh, Mark. Okay, it's, it's 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 rather difficult, I'm afraid, to hear the question, but but as I understand it. Um, it was a question about the status of the convention in English law and how we've come to the position we have uh, under Section 87. Um, uh, the difference, as I see it, uh, is that the European Convention has been made part of English domestic law, and the Act uh, is therefore able to and does make compliance with that international legal order obligatory uh, for extradition in the domestic legal order. Um, I'm not sure um, that the same uh, yeah. can be said of the uh, covenant in law. Uh, but Albert, would you like to uh, uh, com no, comment maybe, or clarify? Maybe, maybe I cannot be clear. Maybe you, if you understand my question, you can. <laughs> oh, well, I think, I think if I understood it correctly, you, you're asking, Mark, um, whether Hong Kong, to what extent Hong Kong could exercise the powers that the English courts have under the um, sec under Section 87, is it, of, of the Extradition Act? I hope Mark can hear you. That, that, that's obviously a matter of Hong Kong law, and if, if the um, Hong Kong executive had the will to do it, um, no doubt it could. Um, to my mind, uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's there yet. Hmm. Oh, so, so maybe I'll clarify my question. I hope I hope uh, I can be heard clearly. Uh, so even though it's uh, thousands of miles away, uh, so my, my question is just uh, whether, in the absence of an express statutory provision similar to the uh, UK, um, you know, Extradition Act Section 87, Hong Kong courts, given the existing jurisprudence, may assert. Uh, the power to to ensure that extradition is compatible with the uh, international covenant on civil and political rights as applied to Hong Kong under Hong Kong's basic law, um, namely Article 39. Yep. Yeah. So, in, in the absence of statutory provisions, I think Johannes oh, may be right. able to I, answer. I, I, that I think it is fairer because this is a question of Hong Kong law rather than English law. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, no, uh, but um, I if I may try to answer Albert's question before I ask the questions, yeah. um, I, I think um, just last week the Hong Kong Magistrate Court has decided in an extradition request from India uh, whether uh, the Hong Kong Magistrate Court in deciding on extradition requests can take into account Bill of Rights. Uh, the Magistrate's answer is no. Uh, this is not in the extradition ordinance and therefore it is outside the jurisdiction of the court to do it. Uh, I have some doubt about the, 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 the correctness of these decisions given that the Bill of Rights applies to all governments and public authorities and any exercise of public right particularly something dealing with liberty of the person, it, it could hardly be seen that it would be outside the jurisdiction of the court. So to that extent, I think even in the absence of express power, uh, there is a good case arguing that Hong Kong court has still a power under the Bill of Rights to uh, consider whether the extradition arrangement is good enough. Uh, having said that, there are others, uh, and there are serious uh, consideration which uh, Cora has uh, mentioned before. Uh, I am not too worried about the Hong Kong court uh, not making a pronouncement that China fails to live up with human rights record or rule of law. What I'm worried is if the court does make such a pronouncement, uh, would the central government uh, embrace it wholeheartedly uh, and thank you Hong Kong for being so independent uh, and criticize China doesn't have human rights and the rule of law? Now, that would be the concern. 
Um, as, as far as my questions, uh, and uh, I'm glad to hear from Granville uh, that uh, how good the PLC legal system is. Uh, and in the, the Court of Appeal judgment from the New Zealand Court this morning, the evidence before the New Zealand Court is that the criminal conviction rate in the PLC is between 98 to 99 percent, uh, which cannot be matched by any country apart from Russia in the world. Uh, I, I wonder what you think about that. Uh, second, in many extradition arrangements with China, it's true that there are uh, quite a number of countries which have entered into extradition arrangement with China. Almost invariably, they retained a reservation that they will not extradite their own nationals. So all those people who are sent back to China are PRC nationals. Could the same analogy apply, therefore, if Hong Kong is going to enter into this arrangement, there shall be no extraditions of Hong Kong permanent residents then. Uh, and thirdly, I'm glad to, to hear that uh, we have 370 fugitives from China in Hong Kong at the moment. So that would mean if this arrangement is to be in place, we would have at least 370 applications for extradition arrangement when we were told this is an ad hoc arrangement how ad hoc it is when there are 370 cases in the pipeline. Any, re res any response? Or would you... Well, it certainly by no means follows that uh, there will be an application for surrender in relation to each of, the <laughs> each of the fugitives. After all, many of the cases might involve people uh, whose uh, alleged offences uh, carry less than seven years. So I imagine that the central authorities would be fairly selective uh, and, in, and only choose the, the most serious cases and, and avoid the, the less serious ones. Uh, quite clearly, there has been uh, a significant improvement in, in uh, criminal justice in the mainland uh, in recent times. Uh, numerous laws have been passed to try to improve things, uh, and however cynical one may want to be about it, uh, it's, uh, it's a disservice to the reformers in the mainland if their work is, is not acknowledged at all. Uh, and so the momentum is in the right direction, even though it may not have been fully achieved, or certainly not to the standards that uh, we would uh, hope for uh, in this jurisdiction. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question for Mark uh, and perhaps Sir Jeffrey as well. Uh, the, I, I think it's quite, quite clear what further um, legal safeguards we would need uh, in order to um, enhance the human rights protection of, of the proposals. Uh, I, I wonder, have you come across uh, extradition cases um, where there is a huge power imbalance, or not necessarily extradition cases, but where courts have to wrestle in, 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 a, in a power imbalance. For example, a very powerful state asking, to, asking for someone to be sent back for trial from a, a small, powerless state that is his, its, its, its ally, for example. And, and how do courts um, in, in those cases, in the, in the small states, for example, deal with the situation? Um, I'm happy to, to take this first. Firstly, um, I, I think there are three things that I'd like to uh, respond to in relation to what I've just heard. Firstly, power imbalance. Um, take the American um, situation. Uh, everyone is uh, imbalanced so far as power is concerned. <laughs> <laughs> And yet the US um, continues to exercise its long arm jurisdiction, and the UK continues to exercise its human rights supervision. So the forum bar that we looked at briefly is now actively um, imposed or exercised by the UK courts uh, for UK nationals. Um, in relation to concurrent jurisdiction cases where, quite frankly, the case can and should be tried in the UK. Uh, so the, the UK courts um, are sufficiently robust, they are sufficiently independent, and frankly it's precisely in cases of power imbalance such as that where an independent, robust judiciary is most needed. If the political reality of the Hong Kong courts it is they're not able to do what the New Zealand courts have today done, then there's no hope. This debate is completely fruitless. Um, and the only way then to, uh, to maintain a hu any sensible human rights uh, system in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is to maintain the firewall that currently exists. But that, that, that's the power imbalance. 
Um, secondly, um, the seven-year threshold for um, requesting extradition, please don't be beguiled by it, beguiling though it may be. Um, uh, shoplifting is punishable with 10 years imprisonment. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and thirdly, the incentive that is said to exist um, in countries such as mainland China and other countries not to breach assurances because of the risk of jeopardizing future extradition uh, relations. Uh, of course that's relevant. New Zealand reminds us so uh, this morning. But in the real world, governments aren't naive. They know two things. They know firstly that possession is nine-tenths of the law, and once an extradition happens, it can't be unwound. Uh, and secondly, they know that it's a card that can be played a number of times before it becomes tired. Uh, so uh, the UK has been dealing with, for example, Bulgaria, Romania, Russia, breaches of assurances, which are swiftly followed by uh, fairly faint apologies, and a second chance, and then a third chance, and then a fourth chance. I think Bulgaria is currently on its fifth set of sequential breach of assurance. The, the idea that it's incentivized not to breach assurances because it thinks extradition relations will fall as a result is, um, is, is not entirely realistic. Sorry, I've strayed off um, the immediate question, um, but, the, but I hope that helps. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, Sir Jeffrey, is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, sorry, we, we can't hear you. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Sir Jeffrey, you might have to unmute. Yes, you can hear me now. Yes, now. Yes, very well. <laughs> very clearly. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, nothing to add to the last point of detail, but a question to Professor Cross. He, he seems to be asking us to take as a given that the judicial system and has improved in mainland China and that human rights abuses are, as it were, something we can overlook. If it were the case that the contrary view, namely that China is a serial human rights abuser with unlawful detention, forced confessions, torture, indeed, and extrajudicial killings, does his argument fall away completely? <laughs> Would you like to respond? Well, hopefully until the 31st of October, the United Kingdom, uh, <laughs> when it will leave the, the European Union. But until that time, uh, the, the UK remains a member of the European Union. And if uh, the uh, UK's partners uh, in the European Union, such as Spain, which in the last uh, 18 months or so has sent uh, 218 suspects back to China for trial, France... Bulgaria uh, and Italy, which have all also sent suspects back in the last two years or so, uh, I'm sure that they would satisfy themselves that they would be uh, treated appropriately upon return. Uh, and they would not be sending those large numbers of suspects back from the EU uh, if they were going to face the, the cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment which Sir Geoffrey Nice is suggesting. Uh, as regards... Uh, uh, the, the point of Mr. Summers about uh, uh, the seven-year uh, uh, figure not being realistic. Of course, our existing, uh, our existing uh, uh, extradition uh, uh, agreements with other, with other countries uh, normally do uh, contain a provision that uh, a rendition may be refused if the facts of the case are trivial. So if someone has stolen an apple in a supermarket, they may, may in theory be punishable with up to 10 years imprisonment, but the offence would, would, if ever taken to trial, would probably result in a small fine, uh, and such a case, uh, if extradition were ever to be sought, uh, extradition would not be allowed uh, and would be rejected under our existing arrangement. Uh, as being far too trivial. Uh, as regards the, the, the Kim case, many of you won't have had a chance to see it, but the way in which uh, it's been described this afternoon, you may think that this is all done and dusted. Not at all. The, this is the Court of Appeal uh, of, uh, of New Zealand, uh, which has simply asked the Minister of Justice to reconsider because he applied a wrong test uh, and didn't have all the relevant information in front of him. So the case is still very much alive, and of course it's uh, perfectly possible that the government will disagree with the judgment which has been reached today uh, and will be lodging an appeal. So please don't think this is final. Okay, uh, I, 
think Phil would like to respond to it. Just one point about uh, the um, concessions that have made about uh, what kind of offences extradition may be sought for and the penalty. Um, they are, I said before, they are rather illusory. You take away specific economic crimes, but the staple for extradition requests that I've dealt with have been things like theft, false accounting, fraud, forgery. Those are the things that come home and home time and time again. And uh, it's, it's not the case only you have the uh, application in respect to a person sought for shoplifting. It could be, as I say, for theft on a grand scale, for fraud on a grand scale. That's the stuff of uh, extradition requests. That's the, that's the reality. Okay. Uh, any anyone else who'd like to make quick comments? What? Uh, right. Uh, uh, Mark and Sir Jeffrey, any further comments before maybe we open it up to the floor? I'm afraid you you cut out. I didn't hear um, almost all of the last proposition. I'm afraid. That's all very good. Oh, sorry, did, did, did. I didn't hear that. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Uh, well, uh, I'm I'm you're looking. Very, you're, you're very short of time, so I suggest you open it up. Okay, so uh, we'll open it up um, to the floor. We'll we'll continue the discussions um, in the next panel session. So, uh, uh, questions from the floor. Welcome back. Thank you very much for your participation in the first session. Hopefully, we'll get to continue some of the exciting discussions that, that we've had in the second session. Our first speaker for the second session is Professor Albert Chen. Um, Albert, uh, maybe I'll in invite you to come to the podium. Use the slides. Uh, thank you, Cora. Um, uh, I think uh, this is a very good opportunity for us to discuss uh, from a legal point of view, even though there are also political aspects to this uh, matter. Uh, we discuss from a legal point of view uh, this very controversial uh, bill on uh, extradition or rendition. Uh, uh, remember that uh, in 2003, we all also organized uh, uh, similar similar uh, seminar uh, uh, on Article 23, the Article 23 bill, and uh, this this time, uh, uh, you know, given the number of people who demonstrated uh, on Sunday, it, the matter seems to be of the same uh, magnitude, uh, if not greater than uh, the Article 23 controversy. So it is important that uh, we should, um, I mean, from from the academic point of view, really investigate into all aspects uh, of this matter. Uh, my presentation today uh, is based on my more recent research on matters of Chinese practices and uh, laws on extradition. So I would just like to share some of the uh, information I have uh, uh, discovered uh, with members of the audience. And I'm also grateful to uh, a few mainland Chinese scholars who have uh, shared with me um, uh, their, their knowledge uh, and information on this matter. Uh, the, this PowerPoint is in, in, in Chinese, so for those of you who can read Chinese, uh, you will find it easier to, to follow. Uh, for, for the People's Republic of China, the practice of having extradition treaties with foreign countries uh, is a relatively recent one, uh, tracing back to the beginnings of the era of reform and opening in 1978 and 1979. Uh, in 1993, uh, China and Thailand entered into the first uh, bilateral extradition treaty uh, in the case of China. As of uh, November 2018, uh, China has entered into 76 agreements or treaties in, on various matters of uh, cooperation in criminal matters, including extradition treaties. Uh, as far as extradition treaties are concerned, uh, China has entered into extradition treaties with 55 countries, and some of these treaties have not yet become effective. So 39 of these treaties have become effective, and as Mr. Cross has just pointed out uh, in the earlier session, they included treaties with some European nations such as Spain, Portugal, France, and Italy. So these four 
treaties have become effective. China also entered into an extradition treaty with Australia, uh, but it's not become effective because Aust Australians uh, have not ratified uh, the, the treaty because of uh, what, as you understand, to be the controversial issues which, which we just discussed. Um, so according to the, the, the data, uh, as of the end of last year, uh, over 120 countries have uh, sent back uh, repatriated to China over 5,000 people, including 56 people in the so-called 100 uh, red um, red tong uh, chap. <laughs> what is it in in in, in Chinese? Yeah, red red alert. The, the Interpol red uh, alert uh, 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 list. Uh, so uh, among the 100 people which China put on to that list, uh, 56 uh, have been sent back to China and over, yet, uh, yet, uh, I don't know, is, is it uh, uh, 1,000 or, or, or 10,000 million uh, uh, dollars uh, uh, no, of renminbi have been, uh, uh, have been recovered. Um, now, not, not all of these people have been uh, sent back to China person to extradition treaties. Most of them were sent back under um, uh, immigration laws on de deportation and removal. Some returned to China voluntarily. So for those who, who were sent back under extradition treaties, according to the data, uh, in the year, in the five year period, 2014 to 2018, 42 persons were sent back uh, from China, from, uh, from countries uh, from foreign countries, uh, person to extradition arrangements. So only 42 among these 5,000 uh, were um, sent back under extradition agreements in recent years. And among these 42 people, 38 were sent back person to extradition treaties, and four people were sent back person to this ad hoc, a case by case uh, extradition arrangement. Uh, in recent years, the Chinese government has launched several operations uh, to uh, aim at uh, the, um, uh, the, the return of fugitives, particularly uh, uh, corrupt officials abroad, and the recovery of, uh, what, uh, of the, the proceeds of crime. These operations include the so-called Skynet operation, Tin Mong in Cantonese, and uh, the Fox Hunt Operation, uh, Lip Wu Hang Dong. So, my colleagues in mainland have used the uh, China Judgment Database, which I will show in the next slide. This is the China Judgment Database, which contains uh, uh, judgments in recent years. Uh, there were over 8 million criminal case judgments, which have been uploaded to this And a search of these uh, judgments using the, the word expedition, Yan Dou, revealed that as from 2013, uh, there were 30 cases, uh, uh, 30 criminal cases in which the word expedition appeared. Now, this, this the number of 30 actually correlates with the number which I just gave you, which was that in 2014 to 18, uh, 42 people were extradited from uh, from abroad to China. So among these 30 cases, uh, 15 cases related to crimes on the uh, uh, on harm to the socialist economic order, and examples of such crimes include smuggling and financial fraud, and tax offences and intellectual property offences. Um, Eight cases related to violation of uh, citizens' personal rights. Uh, violation of citizens' personal rights in Chinese criminal law include murder, wounding with intent, kidnap, uh, etc. Eight cases relate to violation of property rights, which in Chinese criminal law include robbery, theft, uh, etc. So this is the China uh, Judgment Database, and I have... Um, uh, used, I've retrieved two cases uh, as examples of extradition cases, and so I'll briefly introduce to you uh, these two cases, which you can also find uh, 
and have a look uh, yourself. The first case um, was decided uh, by the um, by the Intermediate People's Court in Harbin City in Heilongjiang, and it was decided uh, in the year 2012. Um, so uh, this case involved the extradition from Korea. Sorry, so, so sorry, it's not not two one two. It's a two o one four case. Yeah, two o one four, Heilongjiang uh, uh, in uh, Harbin Intermediate People's Court. This case related to one Mr. Jin, who was uh, a Chinese of Korean descent. And he uh, was a, suspected of committing murder of a few persons, and also mur also uh, robbery. And uh, he escaped to Korea, to to, to South Korea. And uh, actually, Korea, South Korea, and China had an extradition treaty, so uh, he was extradited back to uh, to China to face trial. And um, so, sorry. So this case did not involve murder. Uh, the next case, which I'm going to talk about, that did involve murder. So this case involved Freud. Uh, this person set up a company uh, saying that it was going to recruit people from China to go to work in Korea. And it, it was actually Freud. Uh, he received all these registration fees from people who who, was, who were planning to work in Korea, but in fact, uh, they, were, were, they were defrauded. There was no no actual... Uh, scheme of uh, arranging them to work in Korea. So, so he uh, was guilty of defrauding uh, 67 people. 67 people joined the scheme and paid uh, a total of 4.3 million RMB. So uh, this was the case. And um, and if you read the judgment, it's a judgment of 26 pages, uh, describing in considerable detail the, the evidence uh, actually. Uh, 33 items of evidence were were uh, were discussed by the uh, in the judgment, and in the end, uh, the accused was sentenced to life imprisonment. So this is the Freud case. Uh, the second case uh, was decided by the Supreme People's Court because this case involved the the, the use of the death penalty, uh, and in China today, every death penalty case had to go. To the Supreme People's Court for approval, uh, the first the case was first tried in uh, in a court in Xinjiang, and this person uh, this was a Chinese citizen of Kazakhstan descent, and uh, he was suspected of committing murder of a few people and and robbery, uh, and he escaped to Kazakhstan. And since China has an extradition treaty with Kazakhstan, he was extradited back to China for a trial. And since he murdered a few people, uh, he, he was actually sentenced to death. And the case went all the way to the Supreme People's Court for approval of the death sentence. So that if you read the judgment, it consists of seven pages uh, particularizing the, the evidence. So Chinese, Chinese extradition law was enacted in the year 2000. Uh, I have uh, here a copy of the Chinese extradition law. Um, uh, it is easy to find it on the web. Uh, and you can see that, surprisingly, many of its provisions have, its count, have their counterparts in the Hong Kong Fugitive Offenders Ordinance. For example, I will read to you the English translation of, um, of Article 8 uh, and some of its provisions. Uh, it says that the request for extradition should be refused if it is made for a political offense or if the People's Republic of China has granted asylum to the person sought. Article 8, paragraph 4 says that the extradition request should be refused if criminal proceedings were, have been instituted by the requesting state for reasons of the person's race, religion, nationality, sex, political opinion, or personal status. Or that person may, because of any of these reasons, be subjected to unfair treatment in judicial proceedings. You can find 
uh, almost a, 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 a direct uh, reproduction of these provisions in our fugitive offenders ordinance. China has also passed a law on international criminal judicial assistance more recently in the year 2018. So because of time limitations, I will not uh, go into detail. So this is a very uh, useful book which uh, tells the story of how the Chinese um, anti-corruption agencies have tried to trace corrupt officials who have escaped abroad uh, using extradition or, and other means and also to recover uh, the proceeds of crime. Now, as for what happens to people after they have been extradited back to China, of course they face the ordinary criminal procedure. And uh, recently, our Secretary of Security is saying that, well, we, we will put into the extradition uh, agreement certain safeguards uh, about the defendant's rights. So in mainland China, there has been a lot of research on uh, how to safeguard defendants' rights in criminal proceedings. So here are just two books which I, I just uh, retrieved from the library uh, at random. Uh, <laughs> there are many, many more of such books. Um, Article 236 of the Criminal Procedure Law of China uh, specifies the circumstances in which uh, the, de de the defendant can appeal to a higher court uh, against uh, conviction and against sentence. And the concept of fair trial is actually used uh, in Article 238. If you see here, if the trial in, in first instance has been conducted in violation of the legal requirements re regarding open or public trial, or if um, the, the defendant's legal rights have been violated so that fair trial uh, has been prejudiced, uh, it, uh, or if, if there's any other violation of the law that uh, would prejudice a fair trial, etc., uh, the appeal court should um, quash the conviction. In 2012, the criminal procedure law was extensively amended, uh, mainly for the purpose of improving the uh, the rights uh, of the defendant. Uh, in particular, uh, strengthening the right against self-incrimination, uh, specifying that illegally obtained evidence is not admissible as evidence, uh, and um, strengthening the, 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 the existing provisions against, uh, uh, against uh, forced uh, con confessions, and uh, also increasing the, the opportunities for defense lawyers to participate. Uh, in the early stage of criminal, uh, criminal proceedings, including the investigation stage. Because of time limitation, I will not show the, the actual amendments, uh, but they, they were considered, at least by Chinese scholars, as considerable improvements upon the existing uh, criminal law in terms of uh, the defendant's rights. Now, in um, China's um, criminal procedure law and uh, and extradition has been subjected to vigorous examination overseas, as you have seen, as you have heard from the first session. Here, I, I just uh, uh, show you several articles which you can, if you're interested, uh, research or, or, or read in order to find out more. For example, why is it that Australian extradition treaty with China has not been ratified by Australia? This was discussed in detail in this article on the law and policy context of extradition from Australia to the People's Republic of China. There are several articles uh, about extradition to, uh, to uh, the US. So this article, uh, which was actually mentioned by Mr. Dykes just now, was uh, called, uh, is called Circ Circumventing the China Extradition con con Conundrum, Relying on Deportation to Return Chinese Fugitives. Uh, it's written by a Singaporean uh, uh, it's senior, uh, deputy senior state counsel in the International Affairs Division of Singapore, <coughs> Attorney General Chambers. This article is about the U.S., China, and extradition ready for the next step. And it argues that U.S. actually should enter into an extradition treaty with China and press China to, to improve its criminal procedure. Uh, another article uh, is a comparative analysis of the United States' response to the extradition request from China, which which I think uh, is very useful for our present purposes. What about 
extradition or rendition as between Hong Kong and mainland. Actually, in the year 2001, uh, there was a very detailed report published in both English and Chinese by the Legislative Council Secretariat on extradition or rendition as between Hong Kong and mainland. Uh, so those of you who are interested can read uh, for more background information. Chinese scholars have produced several books about uh, criminal cooperation, uh, cooperation in criminal matters between Hong Kong and mainland. This book is called In Cantonese, Zhong Guo Kui Zai Ying Si Si Fa Hip Zhuo Tam So. And this book is called Noi Dei Yu Hong Kong Ying Si Si Fa Hip Zhuo Yin Gao. So what, what were the, what have, what views has been expressed by mainland scholars as regards rendition as between Hong Kong and mainland? The most interesting point, uh, which was also discussed in the LESCO report I just mentioned, uh, and which uh, is um, described in greater detail in these articles, which I'll mention in the next one or two minutes before I finish, uh, is that mainland scholars, uh, almost all mainland scholars who have written on the topic, argue that not all the internationally applicable uh, extradition principles, that is principles that, that apply to international extradition, such as no extradition of political offenders, uh, no extradition uh, if the, the prosecution is politically motivated, no extradition if because of the person's political opinion or, or religion, he or she is unlikely to receive a fair trial. All these provisions, they argue, should not be applicable to inter-regional rendition as between Hong Kong and mainland. For example, Professor Zhao Bingzhi, probably the, one of the top two or three scholars of criminal law in mainland China, has written this article called Guan Yu Zhou Gok Dai Lu Yu Hong Kong Kin Lap Ying Si Si Fai Wu Zhou Guan Hai Te Yin Gao. So it's about criminal judicial cooperation uh, between Hong Kong and mainland. And he argued forcefully that um, that in interregional criminal judicial cooperation, international principles, that is principles applicable as between criminal ju ju judicial cooperation between sovereign states, should not be applicable. For example, we should not apply the principle that political offenders should not be extradited. We should not apply the principle that military offenders should not be extradited. We should not apply the principle that that death penalty, uh, uh, death pen that people uh, who may be subject to a death penalty should not be extradited. We should not apply the principle that um, local inhabitants should not be extradited. Uh, and he even argues that we should not apply the principle of double, double criminality. So um, this is not only his view. If you read the, the views of other scholars uh, writing on the topic, the, the view such, such as these articles which uh, I, I have uh, put uh, here, their views are more or less the same. That's why uh, I believe that as far as the current um, uh, ad hoc case-by-case -case extradition is concerned, uh, insofar as it is based on the existing fugitive, fugitive offenders ordinance, which incorporates all these safeguards in international extradition, uh, that is already... Um, well, from from the point of view of Hong Kong people, a much better situation uh, or scenario than than that advocated by these mainland scholars. So since I've exceeded my time, uh, I'll, I'll pause here and we we'll welcome further questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert. Um, may we now invite Dr. Asad Kiani um, to deliver his presentation for us. Thanks. 15. Great. Okay. Um, thanks uh, to Cora and HKU and CCPL for inviting me. I'm, it's very honored to be here to talk about extradition. Um, it's, a, it's a strange thing to be a Canadian lawyer talking about extradition in Hong Kong right now. Um, because on the one hand, <coughs> you have the mainland Chinese government telling everyone that you should definitely not trust Canadian extradition laws because they're clearly suspect. <coughs> Excuse me susceptible to bias and influence and not very judicial. And on the other hand, you have the authors of this of, of the law in Hong Kong saying, look, it's just like the Canadian one. You can definitely trust it. It's solid. Um, so, so to be the truth is probably somewhere between those two opposing viewpoints. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about about what that truth might look like. It's a bit more cynical, I think, um, than, than, maybe, than maybe you might expect, but, but we'll see. Um, but, but I want to be clear that what I'm here to talk about today is just to talk a little bit about 
about the ways in which the Canadian system maybe doesn't offer quite the guarantees that, that, it, that it's said to offer, and that even if the Hong Kong extradition law was to mirror that Canadian system, the ways in which it might be vulnerable to exploitation or abuse or manipulation, um, it might not live up to the way, the, the, the ideals that, that are ascribed to it. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And of course, I'm not here to tell the Hong Kong people what their extradition laws should look like. I'm just trying to explain um, what the Canadian extradition law does look like and what it could look like. Um, so all this to say, I think we should be wary, anyone should be wary of using the Canadian extradition law as a model for its own law uh, on the basis that, that it is vulnerable to, to, not to abuse, but it's not as robust in terms of protecting fugitive rights as it's made out to be, um, and that it can, in fact, be used in a very political way, although not in the way the Chinese government in the mainland says it's being used, and certainly not in the way they say it's being used in the main case. I don't agree with that perspective at all. Um, but a couple of things that I want to I want to point out specifically about being wary about using uh, Canada as an example for for Hong Kong. Um, first of all, uh, to the extent that we're relying on Canadian opinions about extradition law at all, as I mentioned earlier, it's telling that Canada has not signed an extradition treaty with China, in spite of having open negotiations for exactly such a treaty. The reasons for not signing that agreement are the same ones that were mentioned in the beginning of this panel or the first half of the panel, concerns about human rights records, concerns about torture, concerns about fairness of trials, all that same stuff is why that extradition agreement was never signed in the first place. Um, so that tells you a little bit about it, although that shouldn't be determinative what Canada thinks, um, but that, that tells you something about Canada's viewpoints on this. The second reason we should be a little bit wary about relying on the Canadian system as being a model for, for, for Hong Kong in particular is that the Canadian extradition system is premised, like most extradition systems, on the idea of interstate uh, rendition or transfers or surrenders. It doesn't take into account one country, two systems. It doesn't take into account intra-regional transfers. None of that stuff is, is contemplated by the Canadian extradition system. It is premised on state-to-state -state relationships. And so the kinds of protections that are built into that system may not be applicable or may be capable of being changed because of the different po uh, political, legal, social, cultural realities of Hong Kong's relationship to mainland China. Um, the third reason why I would be wary about relying on the Canadian model, I'll spend most of the rest of my time talking about this, is that I'm not as convinced as, as many others, certainly as the authors of, certainly as not as convinced as the authors of the Hong Kong bill, that the Canadian model is the best one or the most robust one to protect the rights of individuals. There's a question about who that model is actually good for, and it's worth noting that right now domestic and international human rights organizations have deeply criticized Canada's extradition regime um, for not giving full protection and where it should give full protection. I'll explain a little bit about why that's the case. Um, as I do that, though, I want to talk a little bit about some comparisons between Hong Kong and, and Canada and some similarities that may exist between the laws and explain some of those differences at the same time. Um, uh, the first thing I want to point out in that respect is that Canada does allow, as has been mentioned by many people, including Mr. Cross, that it does allow for uh, ad hoc extraditions in the Extradition Act of 1999. Um, it does allow for that, but there's two important things to note here. One, um, as far as I know, it's never actually been used. You never actually had an ad hoc extradition happen in Canada. It's always been pursuant to a treaty, um, and that's important. It's never actually been used. The second important part of this, though, is that were it to be used as ad hoc agreement, there is no deviation from the standard provisions to be permitted if an ad hoc agreement is entered into. The way the Canadian Extradition Act functions is it outlines a template for the protections and standards to be used in all extradition treaties. They can vary in some of the details in terms of severity of crimes um, and things like that, but it cannot vary in terms of the protections to be offered to fugitives. So any treaty that, that's signed has to offer the same protections to everyone, and any ad hoc agreement also has to offer the same protections to those people who are sought under that agreement. So that is something that's important to keep in mind. There's no variation allowed in that respect, and my understanding is the Hong Kong bill does allow for variation in that respect. 
Okay. So let's put aside then the ad hoc agreement thing for a moment and talk about how it actually works in terms of extradition processes in Canada. There are three stages to it, and they'll be familiar to you because they sound a little bit like what happens in Hong Kong. The first stage is the least controversial, and that is the authority to proceed stage. We have lawyers in the government say, well, we feel like we should be able to actually go to a judge and ask for this guy to be committed for extradition. Okay, that's the first stage. It's at least controversial bit. The second stage is where it starts to get a little more interesting. The committal hearing is the judicial part of the extradition phase. And the next phase, the surrender phase, is the political part. And I use that word deliberately, but again, not in the way the mainland Chinese government uses it. Um, the committal hearing is run by a judge. Uh, what happens here is a judge assesses amongst many other things, what's important for our purposes, assesses the quality of the evidence that's been put forward by the requesting state. So what have they put forward to show that, in fact, this person has committed a crime? It's a prima facie case that has to be shown. Um, some evidence on each element of the offense, and it's construed in the most favorable light for the requesting state. So you give the best interpretation you can to that evidence they put forward, which, by the way, is not the actual evidence. It's a summary of the evidence. It's not witnesses testifying. It's not even affidavit necessarily. It's a summary of the evidence that the state says they have. If you believe that or you accept it in its most favorable terms, then the evidentiary standard has been met. There's no actual evidence that has to be led here. Um, as long as that evidence doesn't appear to be manifestly unreliable, and I'll talk about that standard in a moment, then the judicial phase, at least for, as far as assessing the evidence goes, is over. There's the thing about double criminality that has to be assessed as well. That's separate, not really the issue here. Um, but, the, but what I'm worried about here is, is the nature of the evidence that's put forward. Um, one other important difference that arises here with respect to the Hong Kong bill and, and Canada is that um, at this stage of the inquiry, the person who's being sought, the person who's going to be extradited, is actually able to lead evidence and challenge that evidence that's been put forward by the requesting state. So they can challenge that um, in the manner that you would in a trial. And that's an important, important difference to, to, to note as well. Um, the prima facie case, which is a, a comparable standard to what's used in Hong Kong, is a fairly low standard. Um, it is nothing like the Canadian criminal law standard beyond a reasonable doubt. It is nothing close to that. It's just a prima facie case. Sort of, again, could you proceed to a trial with this? No guarantee of the result, nothing like that. Um, and the reason that standard is so low is because, again, there's three stages to this process. And the idea is that the third stage, the political stage, or the executive stage, the ministerial stage, whatever you want to call it, is supposed to be the fail-safe. The idea is that even if a judge says this person should be committed for extradition because we have enough evidence here, the Minister of Justice in the Canadian context may yet say, look, we're worried about unjust or oppressive circumstances applying to this person if they're actually sent to Kazakhstan or the United Kingdom or let's say China, right? Um, and so therefore, even though a judge says there's enough evidence, these other concerns mean we're not actually going to surrender the person. So it's the job of the Minister of Justice to actually make that assessment and decide to not surrender the person. Of course, there's some important differences that arise here as well. The Minister of Justice is not appointed by or influenced by, in theory, is independent of all other requesting states in Canada. Donald Trump doesn't have a say over who gets appointed Minister of Justice. The UK doesn't decide who gets appointed Minister of Justice. The Canadian electorate takes care of that, and the, and the Prime Minister appoints someone from, from cabinet who's been elected. They become the Minister of Justice. There's no external influence over who that person is. The comparable person in the Hong Kong example, of course, is the chief executive. And the degree of independence isn't quite the same there. So there's that one important difference there as well. The other thing to note, though, is that this fail-safe option actually doesn't work very well as a fail-safe. What happens in, in, in reality is that judges are bound by a low evidentiary standard, and they say, OK, well, our job is done here. We found enough evidence. We pass it off to the minister. It's to the minister to decide whether to not surrender the person. But the minister says, well, from my perspective, I don't care about this criminal for the most part. And I care a lot about this relationship with the state I have a treaty with. And so I'm probably not going to refuse to surrender someone who's been committed for extradition. 
And the U.S.-Canada relationship is a great example of this. 88% of people who are requested by the United States have been extradited from Canada to the United States in the last 10 years. And that's the vast majority of our extraditions. They all go from Canada to the United States, and there's virtually no halt put on those extraditions. Um, and so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, that the way in which this works, actually, like if you actually copy the Canadian model, you'd have not so robust a set of protections that are applying here. Um, and I want to give you an example of, of how this might work in reality. Um, it's about a guy whose name is Hassan Diab, who was uh, a Canadian by way of, of the Middle East. And uh, he was accused of bombing a synagogue in Paris in 1980. Uh, the problem was the French didn't have great evidence. They didn't have much evidence, and it wasn't great evidence either. All they had to link Hassan Diab to, uh, to this bombing in 1980 was five words written in a hotel register from 1980. Um, so they got a handwriting expert in to prove that the handwriting from 1980 was the same guy they'd found uh, 28 years later in Canada. Um, what happens is that first handwriting expert says, I've got a match between Hassan Diab's writing in the present day and what happened in 1980. Here's my report. Here's my proof. You look at the report, you look at the proof, and it turns out that they actually matched the sample from 1980 with someone else's handwriting. So he studied someone else's handwriting, says that's a match to the guy who was in the hotel in 1980. And the Canadian government says that doesn't sound right because you want to match to the guy that we're looking at. So let's try this again. So they try again, get a different handwriting sample, and they match it again the second time. Um, what's interesting, what happens here between getting the, from the first to the second sample is that Canadian prosecutors start communicating with their French uh, colleagues and tell them, look, we need different kinds of evidence if you want to succeed. You need new handwriting samples. Get us fingerprint evidence. Get us this palm print evidence. Bring all of that to us. In the interim, the proceedings are being delayed. The judge says to the prosecutors, what's going on here? Where's the French evidence? We need to move on with this. It's been, at that point, it had been seven or eight years. And the, and, the, and the prosecutor stood in front of the judge and said, oh, we don't know what they're doing. We have no idea what they're doing. Meanwhile, the prosecutors were actually advising their French counterparts on what to do in terms of obtaining evidence. Okay, So that's you know a little bit dodgy if you've ever studied criminal law <laughs> ethics. To stand in front of a court and say, we don't know what's going on, we know exactly what's going on. Um, so the second set of evidence comes back. Now here's what's important. Um, two things. One, a lot of the evidence actually didn't help. It was actually ex exculpatory. The fingerprint evidence didn't match. The palm print evidence didn't match. The handwriting evidence was thoroughly discredited by other experts led by Mr. Diab. Um, and the judge described this handwriting evidence, which is now the only evidence in the case, as very problematic, very convoluted, very um, confusing. Conclusions that are suspect. It's a weak case. The prospect of conviction is very unlikely in the context of a fair trial. But, and this is the big, uh -huh. but nonetheless, the evidentiary standard for extradition has been met. I don't think this guy can be convicted, but the evidentiary standard for extradition has been met. It's not manifestly unreliable. If I give the most favorable interpretation possible to this evidence, then he could be convicted, and that's all I need to do. Because now it's the minister's job to actually decide whether to surrender this guy or not. And the minister says, of course I'm surrendering that guy. Um, and the minister does this in, the, uh, in, in, in one fun thing that he adds to this, um, is he says that I have even more proof that Hassan Diab was in Paris in 1980 because his passport shows that he was in Lebanon in 1980. And of course you're thinking that sounds insane. If his passport says he was in Lebanon in 1980, how does that prove he was in Paris in 1980? Because the French alleged there was a fake passport used. No one's found it. No one knows what it looks like. No one knows where it is. But the Canadian minister said, look, if he's got a real passport that says he wasn't in Paris in 1980, that's proof that he was in Paris on a different passport in 1980. OK. So, <laughs> so let's take a step back then and think about what we've learned here in terms of Canadian extradition law. First of all, at the committal phase, you have independent Canadian prosecutors who are actively collaborating with their French colleagues to strengthen the case against the person sought for extradition and being not as forthcoming as they should be with the court about what's happening. And they don't exclude exculpatory, they don't uh, uh, disclose exculpatory evidence either. 
which in a Canadian criminal court you must do. This is not a criminal court, though. It's an extradition court. Second thing, at the committal phase, the Canadian independent Canadian judge found the evidentiary standard, again, a handwriting sample based on five words from 1980. That is the only evidence they had to be sufficient to commit someone for extradition. Third thing, at the surrender phase, the Canadian minister starts playing Kafka and decides the presence of a passport proves the presence of another passport, which proves he was in Lebanon in 1980. He was actually writing his med school exams, I think, at the time. Um, but my point here is simply that even if you accept that the Canadian model is a robust one and Hong Kong should aspire to be like the Canadian model, this is what you're left with. All these gaps and all these loopholes and all these fail-safes, they don't actually work. The judges defer to ministers. Ministers say, well, I'm not going to overrule a judge. That would be wrong. That would be against the rule of law when, in fact, the process designed for that to actually happen. Okay? And because everyone's deferring to everyone else, no one actually takes responsibility for it, and it's virtually guaranteed that someone's going to be extradited as long as these relatively minimal standards are met. Now, there are other things that Canada seeks to do that doesn't always happen in other places, um, and Canada does seek to sort of limit, uh, and this is the last sort of difference I'll talk about here, Canada does give the minister the obligation to refuse to extradite in situations where to extradite would be unjust or oppressive. And that's all it says in the Extradition Act. Um, but what that actually refers to is a robust jurisprudence under Section 7 of the Canadian Constitution that deals with all sorts of fundamental principles of justice, um, fair trial rights, con detention conditions in prisons, access to medication, um, the death penalty, uh, torture, extrajudicial killings, all sorts of stuff about visiting family, about accessing lawyers, all that stuff is built into this jurisprudence under that phrase. So if you can demonstrate any of those things happening, um, then you can prove or you can compel the minister to not surrender the person. But the standard has to be quite high. The standard has to be that it shocks the conscience of Canadians to actually send this person back to wherever they're, they're, they're supposed to go to. Um, that's one difference that, that arises from, I think, the Hong Kong bill as well, is there's not quite the same level of robust protections there. Um, but I would also clarify, I don't have time to go into this, that in Canada, that's actually quite a high standard to meet, so it's much harder to actually uh, return the person in that sense. So the last thing I'll say then is just this. By all means, I see some some strengths in terms of the Canadian bill compared to the Hong, Canadian law compared to the Hong Kong bill, and I think there's some important things that might be useful for Hong Kong if they think it's important to have these kinds of protections. You might find them in the Canadian law. But that being said, I think Hong Kong can do better, and uh, and if they're really concerned about protecting fugitives, um, then I think you should you should aspire not just to meet the Canadian standard, but to exceed that as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Kiani. Our next speaker is Dr. Margaret. Thank you, Cora. Uh, my job this afternoon is just to comment on the unusual legislative procedure adopted before the two amendment bills. They have very long names. I'm not going to repeat them. One major criticism of the amendment bills is the way they have been handled by the government, which was in breach of due process. First, in allowing only 20 days for public consultation, and secondly, in eliminating uh, the normal step of scrutiny by LegCo's Bills Committee and going straight uh, to the meeting of the whole council for the bill to be debated and voted on. The latest we heard is that the president of LegCo had decided that only 60 hours would be allocated to the whole process. This is certainly very unusual indeed. The proposal to amend the bills, if I may uh, just uh, re refresh everybody's memory as to the uh, chronology, the proposal to amend the bills were announced on the 13th of February. Consultation was closed on the 15th of March. The amendment bills were gazetted on the 29th of March. The first meeting of the bills committee was held on the 17th of March uh, of April. On about the 23rd of May, the Secretary for Justice asked the House Committee to agree to the bill's second reading uh, debate to be uh, resumed on the 12th of June without going through bill's committee scrutiny. On 24th of May, the House Committee agreed by majority vote. 
In the following week, a series of meetings were held in the security panel for members to ask questions on the bill. The last day for the amendments to the bill to be filed was the 1st of June. This is the chronology. Due process applies to legislative procedure and is fundamental to the rule of law. Not so long ago, Lord Newberger, fa former president of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom and non-permanent judge of our Court of Final Appeal, gave a public lecture in this university on the rule of law. He pointed out that the, in the 21st century, there is virtually universal basic minimum set of requirements to the rule of law. First of these is properly enacted law. The fourth is that these laws are generally observed, and the fifth is that these laws are genuinely enforceable. I would like to stress that these three requirements are interconnected. Laws not properly enacted risk not being generally observed and not being genuinely enforceable, and ultimately undermines the legitimacy of the government which attempts to exercise the power under these laws. Under Article 73, subsection 1 of the Basic Law, it is LegCo's function and power to enact, amend, and repeal laws in accordance with the provisions of the Basic Law and legal procedures. So in what ways has the procedure the government has adopted for these two amendment bills departed from these? I would suggest that this constitutional requirement is not just a matter of rule, and formality, but a matter of principle. There is no rule setting down exactly how long the government has to uh, consult the public. There is no rule which sets that the second reading uh, debate of a bill can only be resumed with the support of the bill's committee after due scrutiny. LegCo's rules of procedure only requires that the official responsible for the bill to give a minimum of 14 days notice to the LegCo Secretariat and to have consulted the Chairman of the House Committee before giving notice. However, the principle behind these rules is one of mutual respect between the Executive and the Legislature. To give full warning, and to go against the clearly expressed opposition of LegCo members at the peril of the bill being rejected on the floor. There is no rule, even against going through the three readings of a bill in a single day. At an emergency, and where the proposed bill enjoys consensus, this can be done, and had been done, legitimately. But there is the well-established principle that a bill which involves a change of established policy which affects the interests of the public or a sector of the public must be proposed, must not be proposed, let alone enacted, without full consultation of those who may be affected and properly uh, scrut scrutinized by LegCo to ensure that the protection of the public interest is adequate. And that would also include that the proposals are supported by the community at large and is consistent with the requirement of sound legislative drafting. The greater the degree to which the public is affected, the more fundamental the rights affected the more controversial the terms of the proposal, the more thorough must be the consultation and the scrutiny. In my experience, no major bill has been given less than two to three months consultation period. This is not only because it is consistent with democratic principle, but also as a matter of practical governance. Lord Newberger said, and I respectfully agree, that even in a non-democratic society, the long-term survival of a government system depends on a set of implicit contract, or at least a sort of implicit mutual understanding between the governing and the governed. So since the colonial days and after the establishment of the SAR, until recently, LegCo implicitly followed the principle of due process, including 
ensuring that there is sufficient public consultation and scrutiny and the broadest consensus achievable even in situations of genuine time constraint. And many examples, if we had time, can be found to illustrate this. The role of LegCo is particularly important in the case of Hong Kong because LegCo is the only organ of government with members elected by open and direct elections. In my experience as a member of LegCo of 18 years, two years before and 16 after the handover, it has been LegCo's practice that the proposed policy change which entails legislative underpinning must first be discussed in a policy panel before the government proceeds to introduce a bill. And that once a bill is introduced into LegCo, the House Committee will decide whether the Bills Committee will be formed and the second reading debate will be adjourned until the Bills Committee has completed its scrutiny. In the course of scrutiny of the bill, the committee may call its own public hearing and for submissions and consult experts as it sees fit. This was so even with a highly controversial national security bill in 2003. The two amendment bills are of an even more serious nature than the national security bill because they go to the protection of personal security and property of persons in Hong Kong who live under Hong Kong law. They go to the very foundation of the establishment of this SAR on one country, two systems principle under the joint declaration made between China and Britain. They go beyond domestic worries and are rightly a matter of international concern. Consultation and study of the shape of any amendment should take most, um, and the shape of any amendment should take must include the international community and on the basis of comparative jurisprudence, which is what I think this conference attempts to do today. That no established channel or forum of consultation had been allowed for the amendment bills such as these is unprecedented and is incomprehensible. Moreover, in offering to hold a Q&A sessions in security panel meetings, the government must have recognized that some kind of clarification and discussion is necessary. Yet such afterthought arrangements cannot take the place of proper consultation and scrutiny because a proper consultation and scrutiny is a meaningful exercise of give and take and even possible postponement or withdrawal of a bill. To consult only after a final decision has been made is no consultation at all. Never in my experience of LegCo had discussion of a bill reverted to a policy panel after the bill had been formally introduced into LegCo, except for follow-up action on matters thrown up in the course of scrutiny or enactment. The deep unease of over a million Hong Kong people, some might want to count in a different way, who marched last Sunday, is cause enough to give pause to any responsible government and legislature. Harking back to the National Security Bill in, 20, uh, in 2003, the then CE, Mr. Tung Chi Hua, was initially bent on going ahead with the legislative process, even after the march of half a million on the 1st of July. It was only after members of, a norm, of the normally pro-government Liberal Party revolted that notice uh, to resume the reading of the bill was withdrawn, and ultimately the bill itself was withdrawn. All this is in accordance with LegCo rules and procedure. In this way, due process in legislative procedure is honored, so there is no dishonor if this government and this legislature were to withdraw or postpone the bill even at this stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, I'll now hand over to Professor Johannes Chan.
Thank you, Cora. Um, being the last speakers in a very distinguished panel, it's difficult to find anything to say at this stage. Uh, and uh, after a very long session, I think my task is to keep you awake in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> One question a lot of people have asked, uh, and so far I have not heard any satisfactory answer, uh, is why do we have to rush the bills? Uh, from the very beginning, the reason is there's a Taiwan murder case, and Taiwan has rejected the bill and will not request extradition. So why the urgency? Uh, and there are broad consensus in the community that if we want to deal with the Taiwan case, there are plenty of ways to deal with the Taiwan case without the bill. Nonetheless, this was put forward as the reason and the alternative reason is Hong Kong is full of criminals around the world. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that only the most wise and the excessively stupid uh, people will believe uh, in this reason. Uh, and unfortunately, there are probably not more than three in this regard. <laughs> The government said that it needs time uh, to consult people now. Uh, and as Margaret pointed out, you don't consult and proceed at the same time so that it will be a foregone conclusion. Uh, at least there is a case to answer, why rush? The fundamental problems is a lack of confidence in the mainland legal system. Uh, fundamental premises for all extradition law is that the persons will receive a fair trial at the requesting country. That's why a low threshold of a prima facie case is sufficient, because we trust the persons when he surrender, he will have a fair trial in the re uh, requesting country. And the trust of a fair trial is the precondition of any extradition arrangement. Now, in any legal system, particularly in ours, everyone who faces a criminal charge is entitled to a right to fair hearing. A criminal trial means his liberty and security are at stake. He or she has a right to minimum guarantees of a due process, a right to be tried by an independent and impartial tribunal. So likewise, when we send someone else to a foreign jurisdiction to, fra to face a criminal trial, we have the same obligation to ensure that that person will receive a fair trial before an independent and impartial tribunal. This is not what, as some people want to say, a Rolls Royce standard. This is just the minimum standards in Article 14 of the ICCPR reproduced in Article 10 and 11 of our Bill of Rights. They are, uh, to, be, to, to the credit of, um, of PRC, uh, in the last 40 years, they have made considerable progress uh, in building up a legal system. There are a lot of legislations now. The difficulty is a lot of these legislations are not enforced uh, or implemented. Uh, law is one thing, enforcement is quite another. A second problem uh, in this context is, of course, we are in a very asymmetrical relationship with the PRC. An English court can say any foreign country is a country with a bad human rights record with no rule of law, and if there's any diplomatic repercussions, the British government will be standing behind the court to defend them. In our case, if our court is going to say China has no legal human rights and have a bad legal system, who is going to defend us? Uh, and obviously, uh, only those people who said that don't understand extradition laws, as some of the members on this panel, uh, is left with that task. Um, thirdly, of course, uh, this morning and over the period, we have heard that uh, there are at least 150 to 380 people that China wants to extradite back. And then the government keeps telling us this is an ad hoc arrangement. So if 338 people are on the queue, how could it be ad hoc arrangement? We need a, a court to work full time on that. <laughs> the government said that there are sufficient guarantees for human rights. Um, and these guarantees come at three levels. The first is that the government will secure an agreement, a diplomatic assurance uh, with PRC in particular on minimum standard for a fair trial. Yet the government is unwilling to put them into the legislations, and the reason is uh, to preserve flexibility. But flexibility to do what? It must be a flexibility not to have them, uh, or flexibility not to have them in full force. Um, and it's difficult to understand that, and whether they can secure an arrangement which depends on the bar bargaining power of the chief executive and how much confidence we have that our chief executive would be able to stand firm against the central government and say that unless the extradition proceedings will, uh, will, will be, uh, unless there is such guarantees, the extradition proceedings will not even be initiated. What if the PRC is only willing to give a very general assurance? In the New Zealand case, one of the assurances given by the people PRC is that PRC will comply with applicable international legal obligations and domestic requirements regarding fair trial. How useful that is. 
And if we take the abduction of the bestseller from Hong Kong or the Chinese businessman at Four Seasons Hotel, now they are clearly unlawful cross-border abduction. Has the SAR government secured an explanation, insists on an investigation, or at the very least an assurance that this would not happen again? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, none. But now the government is telling us that we would get an agreement before we initiate the extradition proceedings, and we will stand firm on that. <laughs> very well. Uh, sounds like uh, the CE said we have 100% trust in the people of Hong Kong. <laughs> of course, in the New Zealand case, uh, this morning, uh, a number of panelists has referred to that. It is uh, certainly a judgment which is worth reading. Uh, the New Zealand court reject the diplomatic assurance. Uh, this is something on paper but that is not sufficient. The court has a duty to look at what is in practice. Uh, and what is in practice is there are systemic issues which even China on a diplomatic assurance cannot uh, address the existence of direct political influence in the criminal justice system, the evidence of harassment and persecution of criminal defense lawyers. These are matters which are well documented. So that leads us to the second level of judicial guarantees. Uh, don't be mistaken, uh, we always believe in the independence of our judiciary, uh, but as point out that the judiciary has only limited powers. Uh, the various uh, offence, uh, that various guarantee mark has already taken us through some of these, uh, and unfortunately our system is not much better than the Canadian one. Uh, and the offence uh, has to be a relevant offence, which is not difficult, although it is said to be now a seven years maximum. Uh, there is a prima facie case, which is a very low standard. Uh, the conduct complaint of is an offence if Hong Kong, if it were to happen here, uh, if anyone advising the uh, requesting governments to up apply for an extradition request. If they can't even satisfy that, they should not be in that job already. Mm. Uh, there should be an assurance of no death penalty. Of course, not difficult. Uh, the New Zealand court has referred to extrajudicial killings. Uh, and in one of the cases where China extradites uh, one member to the PRC, the Lai Cheng Sing case, which has tracked international attention, there was an assurance that there would be no death penalty. Uh, and no death penalty was imposed. Mr. Lai just died conveniently in the prison. Uh, if once it's not a political offence, uh, again, uh, it has been pointed out that uh, no country will steal it enough to ask for a political offence. And we have heard uh, from senior officials from China, national security offence is not political. Uh, and of course, a lot of public order offences are not political. And the only two which uh, uh, some of my learned friends are for the government has argued is that uh, the request was not made for the purpose of prosecuting someone on account of his race, religion, nationality, or political opinion, uh, or that person may not be prejudiced uh, or punished on grounds of his race, religion, nationality, or political opinion. Now, race, religion, or nationality doesn't seem to be much of much relevance of political opinions true, the difficulty is how to substantiate that, that you are request for a political, because of your political opinion, or you'll be prejudiced because of your political opinions. There may be some people who can do that, uh, but the burden of proof is on the defendants, and if the charge is uh, a fairly neutral charge, and if we take one of the bookseller, Mr. Lam Wing Gay, if he's still in Hong Kong, uh, and if this law was passed, he could be wanted for an offence for false accounting. Uh, he's selling books in China, he didn't give accounting, there could be a Counting forgery, uh, you name it, the type of offence that is wanted. And can he claim that it, he would be prejudiced because of his political opinion? No one even knows what his political opinion is. What he did is just selling books that China didn't like. So it offers very little assurance on this political opinions, and indeed very few cases could succeed on that. Uh, and what about those people who are not, uh, who do not have any political opinion? Uh, they are just charged with ordinary criminal trial. Are charged. These people are still entitled, as anyone else, to the right to fair hearing. Some people said that if these people are guilty, they should go to face trials. There's what's wrong with that. Uh, the problem is you are assuming that they are guilty already. Uh, they are presumed innocent, and they are entitled to a fair trial. They are entitled to put the prosecution case on test. This is our system, unless we are going to abandon our systems. And none of these guarantees, and these are all the guarantees that the court has to deal with, uh, none of them address the fairness of the trial that the person is going to face if he will surrender. 
including this is not just the trial before the court. It includes also the pre-trial proceedings, the investigation proceedings by the security bureau, uh, the collection of evidence and all these. Uh, they are right not to be forced to confess, right to an open trial, right to have access to family members, right to timely representation of lawyers, right to discovery of documents, right to challenge prosecution evidence or cross-examine prosecution witness, right to address the court, right to an independent and impartial tribunal. And the New Zealand court is particularly interesting, uh, and Phil has already mentioned some part of it. Uh, the court, New Zealand court found that the uh, one murder accused is at high risk of torture, uh, and second, torture is against the law, uh, and it is against the law in the PRC, but nonetheless, it persists. Uh, <laughs> video recording, yes, but video recording is selective, uh, and a lot of, of, uh, of, uh, of, um, uh, a lot of tortures uh, or, or extraction of confessions, they simply took outside the recorded sessions. Um, and they are, this is highly difficult to, dis, uh, to discover uh, false confession statement. There's this incentive for anyone to report the practice of torture. Uh, the political inference is pervasive in the PRC criminal justice system, and this is how the system is designed to work. This is the finding of a New Zealand Court of Appeal uh, in this judgment. Uh, prosecution witness rarely give evidence. Uh, and uh, one part uh, which is interesting, uh, the court also said, uh, and I quote, more troubling is the position of the defense bar in the PRC. Defense counsel must be able to honestly and re responsibly represent an accused person without fear of repercussion if the procedural right is to operate in accordance with its purpose. There was material before the minister to suggest that the defense counsel operate in an environment in which they fear persecution for their representation of their clients and the right not to be compelled to testify to or confess guilt, there was material before the minister to suggest that Mr. Kim could be interrogated for a period of months in the absence of a lawyer. And these are not isolated incidents. Uh, so these are serious matters uh, to be considered, uh, and they could be considered by the, Cane by the New Zealand court uh, because it was expressly provided in the New Zealand situation that any surrender that would violate fundamental principle of justice which underlie the, re the rights relating to criminal procedure, treatment and detention contained within the New Zealand Bill of Rights and International Treaties, that is a ground to reject uh, an extradition request. <coughs> we do not have similar provisions uh, in our uh, FOO. Uh, uh, and although early on I argued that nonetheless the Bill of Rights should be applicable, uh, uh, at least one of the magistrate, magistrate courts uh, has rejected that argument uh, and held that uh, since the Bill of Rights was men not mentioned in the extradition ordinance, the court cannot take that into account. So at the very least, to avoid uh, or to put the matter beyond doubt, this should be included in our bill as an amendment if we want to go ahead. And as pointed out earlier in the earlier session, my concern is not that the court does not make a pronouncement about the situation in another country. My concern is what if our court does make such a pronouncement? Uh, if the court, in refusing an extradition, said in its judgment, as far as the PRC legal system is concerned, torture is prevalent, even unlawful, compulsion to confess or testify is commonplace, political interference with the judiciary is pervasive, lawyers cannot defend their clients without fear fear of repercussion, fair trial is not guaranteed. Will the central government warmly embrace such a finding with great welcome and humility, praising the independence of our judiciary, or will we just condemn our court and put pressure on that? Uh, so uh, on the third level, it is said that now the CE will have the final say not to extradite, notwithstanding that the court is satisfied that the requirements have been complied with. Uh, this used to be an important guarantee, but in the Hong Kong context, if the PRC has made the request, that the CE has decided to re initiate the process, the court has said that as far as the court is concerned, this procedural requirement has been complied with. Is the CE going to say, nonetheless, I am not going to uh, uh, extradite that person. After all, the CE is accountable to the central government. And of course, she can justifiably say her decision was supported by the court now. And we have heard a lot of that before. So at the very least, these are real concerns. And these concerns at least trouble a million of people, and literally a million people in Hong Kong. 
And if the government is genuine in listening to the people, it should at least stay the deliberation, if not withdraw the bill, and leave more time to consult the, the public. And as Margaret pointed out, consultation should not proceed on the basis of a foregone conclusion. Listening to the people will not weaken the authority of the government. To the contrary, an approach that the government knows the best will verge on a dictatorial government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, we will now have about 15 minutes of discussion amongst panelists, uh, and we will end at about 7.45, 7.50. Um, uh, thank you for bearing with us. Um, it, this is an, an, a, an incredibly important and urgent topic, and uh, I hope that you'll bear with our overrunning for a bit. Uh, uh, the, the discussion so far, so uh, you, you don't have to focus on the issues that are highlighted, but I think um, one issue that we've not given a, a lot of um, space to so far is um, I think there is a point in, uh, so I think Grenville Cross has a point in saying that there is uh, an issue of fugitives from mainland China in Hong Kong. The extent of the problem might be slightly exaggerated, but, uh, well, but we need to deal with the problem of fugitive from mainland China um, in Hong Kong, or, or uh, people who've committed crimes in mainland China who are staying in Hong Kong. Well, how, how do we deal with the problem then? Uh, th there are viable alternatives for dealing with the, um, the, the suspect in the Taiwan case, and, uh, but, but what about mainland China? Um, the, the alternatives of, say, extraterritorial jurisdiction being given to courts um, is that viable? There, there seems to be concerns that that would violate, so if I, I, might, I may speak on behalf of Professor Cross, there seems to be concerns about that violating long-standing common law tradition. Um, is that the case? Um, and um, if, it, if in, the, in the final analysis, uh, the issue really is we don't trust the mainland Chinese criminal justice system, uh, then in that case it seems that we, we can't even conclude well, at least at this point, uh, a long-term extradition agreement with China. The time is just not right yet, as the Bar Association submissions uh, have they, they've made this alternative subject to a condition. If the time is right, if we have enough trust in the Chinese criminal law system, we could conclude a long-term extradition agreement. But if we don't have that trust, then it seems that we can't. Con that having a long-term extradition or agreement is not going to solve the worries that we now have because similarly we we have worries about how to enforce that we have worries about power uh, imbalance <coughs> and so on so if in the final analysis we, we don't have an alternative does that mean that we're faced with a bleak valued judgment of um, either prioritizing um, uh, the, the protection of fugitives um, human rights um, or um, uh, 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 cooperating with um, mainland China in um, sending back fugitives. Like, uh, do do we need to make a value judgment? And if we're making this value judgment, um, then I think we, we've got to be upfront about it. Uh, alternatives. So uh, Albert has mentioned. Uh, well, I, I've read from the news that uh, you've, you've mentioned the option of passing the bill first and then reviewing it next year. Would you then support a clause like? something like a sunset clause then, uh, would, would that be a suitable um, also? Well, maybe at this point, I'm not going to go into the other two issues. Uh, I'll, I'll just open it up to, to the can, floor. Can I just try to begin to answer these questions? The last question first. If I were in LegCo, I would never have allowed uh, a dangerous to bill to pass in the hope that it would be reviewed next year. <laughs> this well, is against all legislative principle and the basic duty of anyone who is a member of LegCo. What but to answer your other question, uh, the, we are the, uh, uh, a paradise for fugitives. This is the main point, which is being, being uh, put forward for the, I don't know how many thousand, tens of thousands of signatures uh, that Mr. Gross has been talking about. First of all, I think it would be very interesting 
uh, for the evidence of these three list of 300 uh, fugitives from the mainland to be examined by us to see whether or not we really have become a, a paradise for fugitives. And not only that, it seems that we are only a paradise for fugitives from the mainland, because with everybody else, we seem to have, first of all, either we can have a long-term agreement, or if we don't have a long-term agreement, uh, and there is a, <clears throat> a case by case one, we can, we still have present in the, in, in the fugitive offenders ordinance, the power to consider single, uh, um, extradition. Then, uh, second answer was provided by Mr. John Lee when he agreed to uh, further restrict the area, the scope of extradition, uh, to seven years. Then there were, uh, criticisms that many people will now become fugitives, will be a, fu a paradise of fugitives of the those offenses and his answer and I buy his answer and he says somewhere we have to draw the balance so it is the right balance so uh, we have to look at are we able to accept uh, extradition to a place where the person's human rights will be violated so that we will get rid of our, our bad reputation as a fugitive's paradise this is a balance that we have to make finally if we really have to do this ad hoc extradition, possibly to China, but not confined to it, I think Mark Summers had given us a very good answer. The UK is able to do this because they have strengthened the judicial power in protecting human rights. So go away, strengthen our fugitive offenders ordinance, our regime for extradition. When you have done that, then come back and use it to see if we can protect human rights, even when it is a case of extradition to China. Johannes. Um, just two things. One is in the model, the UN model extradition arrangement, mm -hmm. uh, it has pointed out that in many countries which uh, enter into an extradition agreement with a foreign country, they have a reservation that not to extradite their own nationals. Mm -hmm. uh, the UN model accept that, but then it add a, another paragraph. In that situation, uh, the country will have to find ways to deal with their own nationals within their own system. Uh, so there's nothing new in that sense that when you refuse to extradite for one reason or another, that is not the end of the matter. You can deal with that in appropriate manner. And one manner, of course, is to have extra extraterritorial jurisdictions uh, for the crime. Uh, extraterritorial jurisdictions jurisdiction has nothing to do with the common law. Every sovereign country has a power to enact extraterritorial legislation. Whether you can enforce this is another matter, uh, but that, is all, that has nothing to do with the common law. That has something to do with the colonial system, because the colonial legislature used to be that it cannot enact extraterritorial legislation. That was changed in 1984, when the Hong Kong Act was passed, 1985, when the Hong Kong Act was passed. Uh, and when the Hong Kong Act was passed, the Hong Kong by two resolutions are uh, expressly confer the power on the then Legislative Council on Hong Kong to enact law with extraterritorial effect in order to cater for the transition of Hong Kong, initially deal with IP, merchant shippings, aviations, and subsequently uh, extend to implementation of international treaties. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the, I, I think that, that there's nothing in, in the saying that extraterritorial jurisdiction is a violation of the common law. And indeed, a few existing common law crimes have already extraterritorial effect. Uh, a conspiracy to defraud or a conspiracy to commit a crime, uh, the, the main offense is the agreement. If the agreement was made outside Hong Kong, but the crime or the target of the crime is in Hong Kong, the court would still have jurisdiction to deal with the matter. Uh, there are a number of other crimes like that where the court has the power uh, to uh, try a case which is committed outside the territory. The difficulty is to gather evidence. Uh, that's the practical difficulties, uh, especially when the crimes took place outside. You need the co cooperation of the other states to get evidence. Uh, it is possible to have hearing uh, in a foreign country. It happens all the time of taking evidence outside uh, Hong Kong. Uh, but again, that would request the consent or cooperation of the other state. Uh, but in the case when the other state is asking 
seeking foreign extraditions, there's every reason to believe that the state will cooperate uh, and help. Uh, if the case cannot be extradited back to that country, at least it will be tried in Hong Kong. And in that sort of circumstances, it is more likely than not that the other state will is willing to provide that kind of assistance in terms of evidence and so on. Thank you. Uh, would, would speakers, oh, I'll yeah. something too. I just wanted to add on this extraterritorial jurisdiction point that uh, that philosophically I don't see the objection really materializing. Um, I think it's sort of uh, there's practical obstacles that arise. I'll point out two sort of maybe at least one sort of random crime for which you can exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction in Canada. I'm not sure you would really call it a crime, but if you're a bigamist. Mm -hmm. That's that attracts extraterritorial jurisdiction. So, I mean, whether you're pro bigamy or not, I don't know. I don't care. But that's the kind of thing that you can prosecute people for extraterritorially. And so, I'm not so convinced that it's really a, a strong objection, aside from the pragmatic issues that arise of gathering evidence. Uh, yeah, Albert, yeah. Albert, uh, 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 Albert, yeah, Albert and then Phil. Yeah. yeah, about Canadian uh, extradition law for uh, Dr. Essett. Um, uh, in fact, um, I, I did some research into the Canadian law, and I'm interested in comparing it with uh, the Hong Kong situation, the Hong Kong law, uh, on uh, on three points. Uh, first, uh, I know that in, in Canada, the the court which hears the extradition case is uh, is a very fairly high level court. Uh, for example, in British Columbia, it's the Supreme Court that hears the case, uh, and that is hearing Ms. Meng's case at the moment. Um, whereas in Hong Kong, it is the lowest level, uh, lowest level criminal court, the magistrate's court, which hears the case. So it is the Canadian system deliberately designed so that a fairly high level court would hear the extradition case. Um, this is my first point. Secondly, in the Hong Kong legislation, there is a presumption against bail for somebody who has been um, arrested pending extradition, uh, pending the extradition hearing. So uh, I, I understand that this presumption against bail is taken from the Australian legislation. Uh, I don't know whether it's also in the UK legislation, but I know that in Canada, there's no presumption for or against bail. I think you don't call it bail, you call it something else, but it but the law is neutral, so the court can can decide as as it like uh, whether to to grant what what we call bail. So is this also you know a deliberate design which 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 deviates from the British or or, or some Commonwealth model? My third point is uh, about um, the third stage: the minister deciding whether to to extradite or not. So is is the challenge against extradition mainly a kind of judicial review challenge of the minister's decision? And if so, um, is there an express statutory basis, or is it just uh, the, 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 the ordinary application of the Canadian Constitution, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Thank you. Very quick reply by Assad and then Phil. Sure. Um, first question about level of, of, of court. Because of the minimum requirement for punishment that has to attract, has to apply if you're going to extradite someone, um, it rises to that sort of second tier of criminal courts because to be extradited, you have to have committed allegedly a serious enough offense. That's why it rises up there. Um, the second thing about the presumption against bail, that is more a function of the Canadian criminal courts uh, reluctance to uh, enforce the presumption against pe putting people in jail. Um, so that's been ignored in Canadian criminal courts for a long time. Um, and so the, the courts now require that prosecutors, whether they're acting for France or the UK or Canada, really demonstrate the need to detain someone. And all other measures short of detention should be considered before you actually detain someone. And, and Ms. Meng's case is a great example of the ways in which you can be creative in that sense. Um, as far as how you review the minister's exercise of discretion, it is judicial review um, of the exercise of that discretion under the terms of the Extradition Act under Section 44.1a, sometimes b. Yes, I, I was going to make observations on the uh, the problems of uh, Hong Kong being a, a haven for criminals. Um, if it was truly a haven for international criminals, we would have more extradition arrangements. Um, I'm an experienced 
an old practitioner. I worked in the Legal Policy Division of the Attorney General's Chambers 30 years ago when we were seeking to cement arrangements post-1997. We worked like crazy to get arrangements in place before 1997. When this issue arose, I was surprised to see that only 20 uh, uh, arrangements have been negotiated in basically 25 years because they started this work in about 1988, 1988, yeah, it's more than that, 1988, 1999. So you can't say uh, Hong Kong is an international haven without making attempts to negotiate with other countries to have these agreements. So that rather um, knocks on the head the overall international haven point of, point of view. Yeah. As for mainland uh, source of uh, uh, fugitives, well, the uh, problem there is that in all other jurisdictions, uh, working side by side with extradition and immigration laws, if you have somebody who's undesirable in your jurisdiction, you can, you can get rid of them and there may or may not be consequences in the, uh, the country to which they removed. There may be prosecutor offences there. But a bona fide exercise of immigration power will remove those individuals. Hong Kong does not have the ability to screen individuals coming from the mainland. I've done many cases trying to have pe people reunited with uh, their family here, and they've been refused permission on the basis they have minor convictions. So that um, that ability to scrutinize entrance, which is uh, exercised very jealously in respect to some rather modest cases with rather modest convictions, is totally absent in, as regards mainland immigration. And that is a, one of the other problems. I think long term, the, the relationship with the mainland in terms of who comes in and on what basis should be exa examined. Um, and that's another reason for putting back this uh, dreadful bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, if I may uh, abuse my position to make just very one final comment before opening it up to the floor. Uh, Albert's presentation and, and, and Grenfell's as well um, make me question whether our worries about the Chinese criminal justice system, if we allow the bill to pass, uh, have been exaggerated. Uh, the, uh, so in, in order to assess whether the criminal justice system is reliable, we look at track records. And Albert's presentation make me, it reminds me that there are various types of track records, at least three kinds um, that would be relevant in this case. First, there is the track records of how um, Beijing treats um, its own people. Um, and, but second, there is also a um, track record of how um, they treat um, uh, fugitives from, sent back to China from other foreign states. Um, the third type of track record, which we might not have a lot of information about, is how China treats fugitives sent back to China from a special administrative region with the special status that Hong Kong enjoys, like Hong Kong. Uh, on the on the first type, um, there, there are there are good reasons to say that it's worrying. But on the second type of track record, it seems that uh, what Albert's um, information is showing is that uh, China seems to be by and large, um, or, or might be by and large, abiding by um, extradition agreements with other states. Or, or is that a wrong assumption? Do do we have facts on that? Um, that, I know that some countries, like the New Zealand court, might be worried that um, if sent back to China, um, people will not get a fair trial. But are these worries well founded? Um, and as so, so what what is the proper reference point for Hong Kong? What type of track record um, are we should we be looking for in assessing whether it would be safe to send back uh, fugitives in Hong Kong to? China, and also bearing in mind um, that uh, I, I, Grenfell has mentioned that the Chinese criminal system has improved a lot recently. 
And I remember uh, Fu Hualing, a Chinese expert, mentioning previously that 95% of um, criminal cases in China are treated fairly. There is fair trial in 95%, but of course, it's the party that decides whether you fall into the 95% box or the 5% box. So, I mean, all of this is to put things in perspective. Given all of this, are worries about the criminal justice system in China well-founded? So that, that's just posing um, a question for, for us to think about. Uh, oh, okay, Albert, yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Cora, for raising these matters. I just want to make uh, one or two comments. Actually, if you read, I, I only read the judgment you sent me, the New Zealand case. Actually, our colleague, Professor Fu Hua Ling, was an expert witness. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for the for the uh, government for the New Zealand government, uh, he's ex he was ex presumably he explained uh, to the court how the Chinese criminal procedure did uh, operate to to uh, ensure some kind of fair trial. I suppose uh, we have to ask Professor Fu what exactly he wrote uh, in his expert opinion. Yeah, but he he was cited as an expert witness for the government. Uh, secondly, I think that the data which I just cited is relevant, uh, which is that in, in the five year period 2014 to 2018, only 42 uh, persons were actually extradited. Um, 38, I mean, 42 persons extradited from foreign countries to China. So it shows that it's a very low number. And I also show you that the types of cases uh, which they were involved, mainly, you know, Freud uh, cases, uh, murder, uh, kidnap, uh, and so on. So, so um, I suspect that if the bill is passed, it, it is likely that there will be only very few extradition requests from mainland uh, to Hong Kong. But of course, nobody knows. Uh, nobody can predict the future. That's my own. My my. That's my own guess. Uh, so uh, if. If among 120 countries they only requested extradition of 42 people in five years, uh, I, I don't think uh, there would be a big number as far as Hong Kong is concerned. But that's only my 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 own guess. Uh, questions from the floor. We'll take three questions uh, at a time. I, I, the hand at the very back there, and one hand here as well, uh, and. Uh, the, the gentleman in, in orange. Can I just jump in while, while, while we're yeah, giving the microphones yeah, yes, out there? Please. Just on this point about emphasizing, maybe assessing China's uh, criminal justice system. I think so, it's, it's important to, to obviously assess the system um, that this person might be sent to, that's important to do. But I think it's also important to recognize that even if it's a great, liberal, democratic, fully protective system, the criminal law is really harsh, it's really punitive, and the criminal law process and the trial is always difficult for someone who's gonna face that. And you should be cautious about sending people overseas, even if you're sending to a place like, let's say, France. Just to wrap up that story I was telling about Hassan Diab, he got to France, um, and eventually the French court threw out the charges. They said, you don't have enough, you don't have enough evidence, weirdly, um, to prosecute this guy. So they threw the case out. But before they threw the case out, he spent three years in solitary confinement. So on the one hand, you have a court that's like, oh, we're going to enact fair trial processes. The case doesn't go ahead. That's wonderful. On the other hand, it takes him 10 years to get to this point. He spends three years in solitary confinement. As you all know by now, the UN Convention Committee Against Torture says 15 days is torture. He spent three years there. So on the one hand, we should worry about what that system is actually like, but we should also recognize that intrinsically the criminal justice system can be very damaging to people. Question one. Um, quick responses from our speakers. Uh, would anyone like to start first? Okay, Johannes. Just a quick reply. As far as uh, Mr. Lai is concerned, I think I got more or less the same source. Uh, and, the, the, and that highlights the difficulty of the Chinese legal system because it is not transparent. Once you are in their criminal, particularly with their, 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 their prison system, uh, you, you simply lost. Uh, there's no way you can find out. Um, so uh, that's the first answer. Uh, the second un uh, quick answer, and I think someone else could add to it, is yes, you can review the CE's decision to extradite. The difficulties on what grounds, 
uh, if the person has gone through the court proceedings, etc., uh, and as far as the agreement is there, and you can't challenge the agreements, there's very little ground you can challenge the CE. Uh, so uh, that would be the simple answer. The third answer, as far as the asset is concerned, uh, yes, uh, that has been relatively less discussed, but it is a serious issue. Uh, one is the power to in, uh, to invoke mutual assistance on uh, freezing access or uh, uh, search and seizure. That is not confined to the list of extradition offense. It's not within, it, it could cover offenses outside that list. Uh, and the threshold is even lower than a prima facie case. Uh, I think maybe Phil can add to that. Uh, yeah. Can I? Yeah. yeah, of course. The asset one. Uh, a comprehensive answer, Jenna. <laughs> but I can tell you, um, in 1993, a matter of interest, um, uh, Malaysia sought to gather evidence in Hong Kong there's an interesting court case where the court has said, no, this is a political offence. It's quite robust. Um, I can't remember who the judge was, but that's the only example I can find of a court in, in Hong Kong recently saying, no, this will, we will not provide assistance. By analogy, they will not, provide, uh, they will not surrender uh, because of pol uh, political matters. It's worth looking up, but I, I forgot the name of it. Margaret. Right, let's go. I believe this let's go is surrendering its own autonomy. I don't believe that there's any unruly behavior within let's go of let's go members that cannot be dealt with under the rules of procedure and internal discipline. As far as the bills committee uh, on the, um, the, the two amendment bills are concerned, it is quite straightforward that the, secret the Secretariat was following the rules in uh, uh, appointing the most senior member to uh, chair the meeting for election of the Bills Committee's chairman. I've done that many, many, many times. In this case, uh, the question was whether um, James Toll uh, was acting correctly in taking so many procedural questions. First of all, there is no accusation that his uh, procedural questions were wrongly taken. Secondly, if the bills committee uh, were of the view that he was taking too much time and they have lost confidence in him, a simple vote would get him out of the chair. Then so, for so long as he is legitimately in the chair for uh, the uh, process of electing the chairman, then that process should be gone through. What happens is that the uh, pro-government establishment part of the uh, LegCo was not happy with the fact that their intended chairman uh, was not elected, and that is quite a different process. Uh, in the, as so far as I know, the what followed from uh, the two meetings what followed from the two meetings where the chairman uh, was not elected uh, was illegitimate because when it went back to the, to the House Committee and the House Committee gave a direction to the Bills Committee, that direction should be considered by the Bills Committee itself and not issued as an order from the, from the House Committee and certainly not for the Secretariat to tell members what to do, including uh, signifying uh, their uh, choice uh, by, by uh, circulation. So that, if you look at that as being illegitimate, then James Toll was still legitimately in the chair. And it's extremely easy to get rid of him because if the, the pro-establishment members have the majority, all that, have they, all that they have to do is to vote him out. But they, they refuse to do that. Instead, they have resorted to other methods which are wholly unheard of. For example, creating a rule uh, that the most senior pro-establishment uh, member uh, should uh, a chair should officiate at the election of a chairman. This is wholly unheard of. So to sum it all up, I believe the Legislative Council had all the powers and all the rules of procedure it needed to deal with the, the, the situation effectively, and they have failed to do that. They have only themselves to blame. Albert or Assad? 
Just very briefly, I, I'm not an expert on this uh, uh, recovery of proceeds of crime uh, and so on. I, I think my colleague, uh, Professor Simon Young, is the expert. He, he is not in Hong Kong on the moon. That's why he cannot come. But I, I heard from him that um, that Taiwan has a special interest in this matter because if Taiwan can establish cooperation in criminal judicial assistance uh, with Hong Kong, then Taiwan would be able to recover some very large uh, <laughs> amounts of money uh, relating to a to a, a case, a Taiwanese case uh, uh, in Hong Kong. So maybe that is an incentive for them to to uh, to also agree to the expedition of Mr. Chen Tong Gai. I don't know, uh, but uh, but I also want to comment on the judicial review of C's decision. Um, now that the uh, the government has. Uh, said or has published this policy statement on how to um, get assurances from from his extradition partners. Uh, I believe that um, given the policy statement, if in a particular case, particularly relating to mainland, the government does not get these assurances uh, in the extradition agreement, uh, then the extradition uh, decision might be uh, challenged. Uh, uh, but I'm not an expert. Maybe, maybe Mr. Dykes or, or Johannes or, uh, can comment on this. Well, well, the New Zealand case today is precise on that point. It's, it's a review of the minister's decision-making process when handling assurances, what you should look at or what you should not look at. So, yes, uh, there is a potential for judicial review. If assurances are forthcoming, I suppose you might even make a a case in a judicial review because you've not sought assurances, but uh, we'll see. We'll see if that's the case. Uh, uh, Assad, any further? Okay. Well, a, a, a lot depends on how it is written. If it is in the law, it's much easier. But if it's in agreement, and if the government insists on flexibility, uh, it will uh, seriously hamper the power of the court to judicial review that. Well, it also depends on the content of well, as she said, how it is written. Because if it says we might ask. The, the requesting state to take these into account, that at most they would constitute relevant considerations. Um, you can't have a, say, legitimate expectation base, based on the policy statement. Um, thank you so very much. Please join me in thanking these excellent speakers. And a uh, special thanks to Dr. Kiani for um, flying all the way from Canada to lend us his expertise. Thanks Thank you so me. much. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank um, Shona, Helena, Margaret, um, Johnny Patterson, Claudia, Amanda, my colleagues, Johannes, Albert, Richard, Colin, and Rachel for their support. Acting Dean Falling, um, who uh, agreed to fund the event, and he insisted that the faculty should do the heavy lifting in times like these. Um, the CCPL, uh, Winnie and Elizabeth, uh, for their support. Our technical team, Murphy and Heng. Our student rapporteurs, Rafal, Anne, Parmeet, Kelly, Sam, Edward, Dennis, Katie, Hillary, for their help on very short notice. And finally, thank you all for joining. And can, I, can I propose a toast of thanks to Cora? Because I know how hard she had worked in a very, very short time to put this conference together. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sarah. That, that's really sweet. Thank you. Um, well, regardless of what lies ahead, uh, this conference marks your contribution to rational discourse in an important and turbulent chapter of Hong Kong's history. Thank you, and see you in the future.